We got a few technical difficulties, so just a second, folks. Okay. All right, Brian, you're live. All right, thank you, Josue. Um, so uh, again, uh, welcome to the July 20th, 2020 regular council meeting. And um, uh, Judy, if you could call the roll, please. Indeed, House. I'm here. McQueen. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Present. Curlis. Here. Also present is village manager Josue Salmarone. Finance Director Colleen Harris, I think Johnny Burns, Public Works Director, Planning and Zoning Administrator Denise Swinger, and our Village Solicitor Brianne Parcels. All right, thank you, Judy. Um, so I guess first of all, I know that we're having some technical difficulties. Um, Josue, do you want to highlight what's going on and you know what's live and what's not, or? Yes, thank you, Brian. We are having some technical difficulties with our broadcasting system. Uh, so typically we broadcast via Facebook, YouTube, and Channel 5 simultaneously. Uh, unfortunately, today we're having some network challenges and we're only able to, able to broadcast to Facebook. So if you're watching us on Facebook, that's great. For those that watch us via Channel 5 and YouTube, I'm sorry that I'm we're not broadcasting through regular channels, but this video will be uploaded to YouTube and it will be broadcasted via Channel 5 as well. And we All right, thanks, Josway. And, and then I'd like to uh, request that we make sure to include on the Facebook chat uh, the information for anyone that wants to join the Zoom meeting. Uh, for either making comments or if that might be an uh, easier way for them to uh, uh, engage with the meeting. Uh, so with that, um, we are uh, at the announcements uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, do any council members have announcements? First of all, I wanted to mention that if people haven't been following, um, we are still able to complete our census forms, and you can do that at uh, my2020census.gov. Uh, it has been emphasized that that can happen until the end of July, so July 31st, but um, they may also continue to keep that open to make sure they're capturing the most data Remember, it's important to complete your census because it helps to make sure that the village gets the funding that we need to support all our social services, uh, education, a variety of different things. Um, second thing I wanted to mention is um, that, again, we do not have a meeting during the first week of August. So our next council meeting will be August 17th. Uh, that'll be the third week of August, um, and we do this so that uh, some of our key staff members that are part of uh, running our meetings can uh, take a small break, which I assume is, is not going to involve uh, getting to uh, travel out of Ohio. Uh, third thing I wanted to uh, announce or thank is, again, our mask ambassadors who uh, have been out for the past two weekends. So for three weekends now, we have had um, volunteers making a difference to uh, thank people for wearing their masks, to make sure that um, uh, you know people need to upgrade their masks or need to understand why we're requiring masks. Uh, we're there to help them with that. Um, so related to that, uh, since masks are not on the agenda tonight, I did want to cover some ground that might uh, anticipate some comments that people have. Uh, believe me, the village team is aware of some 
uh, folks that do not want to uh, comply with the expectations around distancing and mask wearing, and uh, we're concerned about that. Uh, I hope everyone has understood that passing an ordinance isn't a magical fix and that some of these uh, things take some time. Um, I guess I wanted to specifically mention to uh, everyone listening um, that it's been very clear that we have three sort of uh, problem groups. Um, the first one uh, is, and I'm not gonna be coy about the name, Dave Chappelle and his entourage uh, have been downtown every time I've been downtown without masks. Uh, and I think that may encourage other people to feel that they don't need to wear masks. So if anyone, uh, you know, has uh, got a line to Dave, please let him know. It would really help our efforts if he and his crew were wearing their masks uh, and, and respecting what we want to see downtown. Second group, no surprise, uh, we have a lot of young people that often hang out outside of uh, the Spirited Goat. Um, it's been unfortunate. Um, we do not want to like be, you know, like pulling people aside and creating a lot of issues, but the reality is this behavior is really unsafe. We've all seen a lot of gathering that is not so different from what has created problems in Florida and Texas and other places. So again, you know, I want to encourage folks to, you know, do the right thing. The third crew has been a lot of our young people that are local. And um, I want to encourage our uh, parents and guardians to remind our local youth that they need to wear their masks. It's important to keep people safe. Um, Yellow Springs has been doing a great job and we want to continue to do that. And uh, we don't want to have to you know, pull back on reopening. We don't have to be want to be more restrictive. And so at the end of the day, it takes a village. And so we're asking folks to do the right thing, respect public safety. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn to Marianne, or I'm sorry, to our consent agenda, where we have uh, a couple um, minutes from our last meetings. And uh, Judy, um, I guess I'll first of all ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move that we approve the consent agenda. A second. second. Okay, heard a second from Marianne. And Judy, if you could call the roll, please. Yes, Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Curlis. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay, next up, a review of the agenda. So anything we need to add, modify, or change? Yes, I have one. I, I, on the existing agenda under new business, I wanna remove the letter regarding the wildlife habitat community because it's covered by the resolution under legislations. And I would like to add a brief time for Karen Wintrow to, to introduce the wayfinding proposal uh, which she has in uh, communications all right that sounds good put that in and take the habitat out all right thanks marianne anything else um so actually i guess there was one other item which was uh i wanted to make sure that we had a chance to talk about the uh Black Lives Matter uh, street mural, which I would suggest will also come in new business after um, talking about um, Short Street. Okay, anything else? That sounds good, Brian. I was gonna bring it up then, thank you. All right, All right. thanks, Lisa. Uh, anything else on the agenda? Okay, uh, if not, then uh, Marianne, uh, petitions and communications. Yes, we have a, a number of them. Uh, so I'll go through the list. Jean K, yes for a mask ordinance. Kate Mooneyham, no for uh, opening up Short Street. Maria Booth, no for opening up Short Street and yes for the masks. 
Catherine Vander Heiden, yes for masks and for working together. Mary Alice Wilson, yes for masks. Susan Carr, yes. Amy Wamsley, yes for busking. Diane Davis and Cindy Saw, yes for masks. Nancy Mellon, yes. Leslie Lippert, yes. Peggy, or Margaret Kobernick, yes and yes, two letters. Ellen Hoover, yes for masks. Becky Cooter, yes. Linda Keaton, no for mask ordinance because of enforcement concerns. Christine Reedy, no for masks. Carl Ransom, open up businesses and don't have masks. Lisa Howell had an up COVID update from the Greene County Health Department. Thomas Keller had a letter of concerns about construction beside his house. Nina Pallotta wanted to know if the village could provide funds for uh, businesses downtown since the senior housing project is not happening uh, this year or next year. Uh, as I mentioned, Karen Winto has the proposal about the wayfaring signs. Project um, 365 has an affirmative marketing brochure, which was also contributed to by Home Inc. and the Chamber of Commerce. Jamie Sharp, yes for masks, no for short street opening, and no for a food truck on uh, village parking space. Emily Seibel had an update for the Glen Cottages project, and Brian had that amazing street mural in Cincinnati, Black Lives mural in front of the city hall, and that's it. I have been asked to read in a letter. Is this the appropriate time to do that, Brian? Um, I mean, is that citizen is concern? That, you know what? Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> But I it was a communication, but I'll, I'll do it during some of these concerns. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, all right. And thank you, Marianne. So we've got a few pieces of legislation. So um, Judy, if you could read ordinance 2020-14 in by title only, please. Uh, this is a supplemental appropriation uh, for the And, sorry. Actually, I can help you out with that. It's approving supplement third quarter supplemental appropriations and declaring an emergency. emergency. Thank you very much. Yes. So can I get a motion, please? <laughs> I move. Second. Okay. Um, so uh, we're reading this in as an emergency, and uh, I'm going to open the public hearing and then let Denise Swinger uh, take over. I'm, I'm sorry, Colleen Har Harris. Thank you. Are you there, Colleen? Am I thought you said you were opening it up to the here um, people first. Um, so my ordinance third quarter supplemental is two hundred and sixty thousand two hundred eighteen dollars. We're asking to bring into the budget, and the three items that total that amount are for seventy thousand dollars for land purchase. That'll be coming out of the general fund. Then there is $60,000 out of the sewer capital for sewer lining projects. And we did receive $130,218 from our local county government for the um, COVID-19 reimbursement expenses. And that's what I'd like uh, council to uh, entertain approving so we can add that to our budget. All right, thanks, Colleen. Um, Josue, do you wanna talk a little bit more about the, the first piece of that? Yes, Brian. Um, the $70,000? Yes. This is where we're looking to buy property in the village. Uh, and this is to, for the purposes of protecting our infrastructure and protecting some of our parking assets. So um, we will be acquiring land, lots in the community for these strategic activities. Okay. Do you want me to go into more specific? Some of this as, as a lot of real estate activities and transactions want to be discreet until they are um, close to being a done deal or it's a done deal. Right. And so right. it's not being coyed, it's its own purpose. Yeah, no, I think that, I think you covered it well. 
Um, uh, now on the on the hundred and thirty thousand, if I may add a note, yep. this hundred and thirty thousand dollars is also our CARES Act distribution. Um, but I didn't want there to be any confusion about county distribution of CARES Act money. The CARES Act money comes to the county and then it's distributed to us. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, any questions from council members? Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from citizens? All right. If not, uh, uh, Judy, if you could, uh, well, I, actually, I will close the uh, public hearing. And Judy, if you could call the roll, please. Yes, Krieger. Yes. Curlis. Yes. Jokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Ouch. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, next up we have resolution uh, 2020 uh, 30. And Judy, if you could read that in full, that would be great. Yes, this is supporting actions towards the village becoming a national wild wildlife habitat community. Whereas village value number five passed by council is one of the bases for their annual goals states, seek in all decisions and actions to reduce the community's carbon footprint, encourage sound ecological practices, and provide careful, creative and cooperative stewardship of land resources. And whereas the village of Yellow Springs is surrounded by natural areas and our environmental commission, working with Tecumseh Land Trust, Community Solutions Inc. and the Glen Helen Association, seeks to replicate these natural spaces, building and restoring healthy, native, wildlife-friendly, pesticide-free ecosystems throughout the village. And whereas to build such ecosystems, citizens of the village must be engaged to participate in this collective effort by assessing their properties and planting for wildlife, which includes providing food sources, water sources, places for shelter and cover, places to raise young, and very importantly, sustainable practices. And whereas sustainable practices will be prioritized, including organic practices, pesticide elimination, soil and water conservation, and controlling exotic and invasive species. And whereas to achieve the goal to certify the village as a National Wildlife Federation wildlife habitat community will require like-minded organizations to join the effort. Now, therefore, be it resolved that section one, in keeping with village values and council's 2020 goals, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs does support the Environmental Commission working in collaboration with Tecumseh Land Trust, Community Solutions, Inc., and the Glen Helen Association in their efforts to educate and inspire members of the community to adhere to NWFWHC practices. Can I get a motion? I move. I'll second. Second. Okay. Um, Marianne, do you want to say anything? Sure. This was a goal that was recommended by the Environmental Commission and approved by Council as one of its 2020 goals. The purpose is to, as much as possible, naturalize uh, people's properties, whether it's homes, businesses, churches, schools, village-owned property, which would involve having native plants, water conservation, minimizing or omitting uh, artificial fertilizers and pesticides and removing invasive plants. And uh, so the Environmental Commission has reached out to Tecumseh Land Trust, the Glen, and Community Solutions. And we have a team of those four organizations that are working on this project. And we're well on the way. And we get points for di doing different things. And a big part of this is and will continue to be education for the community, but we do get points by having village council pass a, a resolution. So that's the purpose of this. All right, thanks, Marianne. Um, any questions or comments from council or citizens? I have one, just one question and just wanted to know you know, when I think about our practices here at the village on the village properties, um, how far are we from, you know, being in compliance in terms of our uh, landscaping and fertilizing and pesticide and all that? How close are we to being in compliance? That's a good question. Uh, today, uh, I went out with Catherine Zimmerman, who's really the person who's been leading the charge on this, to the glass farm conservation area, and it qualifies. We just got it qualified today. But 
of all, that is really the only property of Billy Shown properties that would qualify for the various criteria. Now, what Catherine and I were talking about today was taking another, taking a project on, and probably it would be the Bryan Center project property, and seeing, sort of identifying an area on the Bryan Center property that would be very visible to people, and then creating a project around that so that that area could be certified. But it, it isn't just it involves having uh, pollinator plants, source of water, places for small animals and insects to hide, uh, not using pesticides, and a variety of things. So uh, at this point, the glass farm area is the only area that would be certified a village property. And I think, we, you, have about, I think we have about 50 uh, residences now. I might be wrong on that number, but we have a lot of residences that have become certified. Wow, that's great. Um, anything else? All right, well, I love it. Thank you so much, Marianne. And, mm -hmm. um, and Catherine, I know, has been a big driver in the Environmental yeah. Commission. Um, so with that, uh, Judy, if you could call the roll, please. Yes, McQueen. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Curlis. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Housh. Yes. Thank you. Okay, and lastly, we have resolution 2020-31, and Judy, let's do that by title only, please. Okay, this is authorizing the village solicitor to file a proof of claim in the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy case on behalf of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. All right, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All right, uh, Brianne, is this you? Sure. I'll cover the overview and then uh, oh, then okay. I'll okay. get it. Yep. Uh, thank Great. you, Brian. So as you uh, you all may be aware that uh, a lot of the opioid crisis was driven by the strategies deployed by pharma by the uh, Purdue uh, Pharmaceuticals, where they encourage providers to prescribe opioids, and that got uh, a lot of the country addicted to to the drug. Um, so there's a lawsuit that took place. We want to participate in this lawsuit uh, to, by filing a a consolidated claim. This will allow us to recoup some money for the expenses that we've had um, directly related to providing services uh, related to the impact of the opioid crisis. Uh, so we have two processes to, that we are able to follow. One is an individual claim, and the second option is a consolidated claim where we would participate in everyone else's claim using a formula. We looked at both options, and the numbers work out to be about the same, the tune of a little over $2 million. So, but in order for us to file that claim, we need your authorization to be able to be party to the suit. And I'll let uh, uh, Brienne take over. Yep. Um, just to clarify, there was a multi-class action, basically in the nature of a toxic tort, which was all consolidated in the Northern District of Ohio against Purdue Pharma, other opiate companies um, related to their actions in advertising and encouraging prescribers. As a result, Purdue Pharma filed for bankruptcy. When we're filing this proof of claim in the bankruptcy, not see a penny, but you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And if there is any sort of settlement, filing this proof of claim would give the village grounds for uh, being consolidated into that pool for restitution, um, if it is ever awarded, sort of similar to what happened with the tobacco settlements. Um, that's the speculation as far as what could happen. Um, so again, this, this would allow us with council's authorization to file that proof of claim in the bankruptcy, which would then get kicked over for approval to the multi-class litigation that's pending in the Northern District of Ohio. All right, thanks, Brianne. Thanks, uh, Josue. Uh, any questions from council members? Uh, any questions from citizens?
Okay, I am not seeing any. Uh, so, uh, Judy, if you want to call the roll, please. Yes, Curlis. Mm, yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Pausch. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, just out of curiosity, who who uh, identified this opportunity? Was that you, the Ohio Municipal League flagged it for us. Okay, so we found that out through the Ohio Municipal League. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, okay, we are now at the time on the agenda uh, for citizen concerns. So this is where we ask that you uh, limit your statements to three minutes, and this can be about anything that is not on the agenda. So if this is related to um, some of our issues around uh, response to uh, racism as a public health issue or anything else, those are coming later in the agenda, uh, but we welcome any other comments that are not on the agenda. Um, so do we have any citizens? Hi, um, can you hear me? My name is Tom Keller. Yeah, Tom. Yes. Hi. Well, I, I got three minutes here, I guess. I, I live at 207 Gardendale, and uh, there's construction going on next door, which is on 211 Gardendale. And there's two problems with it. Um, there's a construction which is having issues, and then there's the post-construction. In the construction, which is going on right now, there's gravel and mud in the streets, which endangers kids who might be riding around on roller skates. Uh, there was a curb that was broken by a heavy truck uh, there's strangers parking all the, all around all the time, walking around, who I don't know. There's a blocked mailbox. There's eight months of a porta potty sitting out in front of the neighbor house. There's eight months of a trash bin sitting out in front of the neighbor's house. There's a noise, uh, concrete mixer, hammers. That's not that bad. Uh, but then there's also trash on my property, which has been left. And then Vectran has been a real pain. Uh, they just come in, they came in three times and, and uh, dug holes and didn't tell me they were coming in and they didn't clean it up until I got after them to fix uh, what they broke, uh, digging a big hole. Uh, and there was no communications with me about this construction that was going on. And that's the construction part. On the post-construction, this uh, new house uh, has water flow issues. Uh, it used to be the water would go out front to the street uh, we don't have swales around here. We just have uh, storm drains. And now the water just goes out the side. It all goes north. All the, the gutters all both go north. And from there, they're going to go south to the, uh, to the house behind that house. And we have a lot more rain recently. And I have documented some of the flooding which has gone on on, on Northwood. Uh, also, uh, you know, why, why shouldn't a new ho old house, which is being renovated, have a, a water plan. I believe new houses have to have to deal with that. Uh, also, on the north side of the house, there's a the gas furnace exhaust, two AC units, a dryer outlet, all on the north side. And they're not on the back, they're on the north side, which is right next to my house. They're facing my bedrooms. On the south side of this house, there's a driveway which has been installed in between the houses. No other house around here has one of those. Uh, and the house is larger than any other house in the neighborhood. It's kind of outsized. Uh, and I don't really believe that it, I believe this house actually damages my value, or the value of my house because of the construction going on and because of the intrusion on my, my property. Uh, if you look at the side of the house, it's, you know, the, the side of, back is on the side. Uh, that's all, that's my three minutes, I guess. All right, Tom, thank you for sharing that. Um, so what I'd like to ask our village staff to do is um, follow up. I know that uh, I've seen some things from Denise Swinger uh, about some of these issues, and um, we don't really have an opportunity to discuss this tonight, but what I can say is that at our next meeting, we will ask for a report to follow up on um, these issues and make sure that they have been addressed. So Tom, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, uh, any other citizen concerns? Okay, I see Brian Naya. Brian from 
I'm sorry, go ahead. I was waiting. Comments from social media? Um, not yet. I okay. see that uh, Naya Brevik, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I know you said you'd um, address the racism of the public health crisis later. Can I still speak about that now, or should I wait until later in the meeting? Uh, probably better to wait, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I see uh, Julian Roberts, same thing, or? Same thing, yes. Okay, cool. Um, all right, any other citizen concerns about things that are not on the agenda? Uh, Brian, I, yeah, I've got this letter to you that it's been requested that I read to council and to folks. Okay, yeah, please read that. All right, there's an introductory letter and then there's a petition. Introductory letter states, dear council members, and this is by the way from Ursa Northstar. I don't care what the rest of the world is doing to make mass hysteria the new norm. You have trampled all over my constitutional rights. I do not feel for one single second that I will be heard except by the cosmic intelligences who I'm petitioning for outside assist. I'm petitioning for a radical change in the current Yellow Springs theater of the absurd that is turning so many once reasonably sane villagers into authoritarian barbarians, bit players in the theater of the absurd produced and directed by the de facto reality of global tyrants Enclosed, a letter to the heroes Arcos, the sacred leadership of the cosmos, and this is that letter. I would like to question the virtually inaccessible meetings of our village council who continue to meet in virtual reality. Decisions and resolutions zoom by like trucks down Xenia Avenue. Our political state is far too much in our space, our cultural lives, and now our personal freedom of choice. At all levels, politicians and elected officials are usurping our freedoms and making laws about our personal choices that are dehumanizing, disempowering, and stultifying to human evolution. They have desecrated our shared public spaces with official decrees, threats, and ugly graphic scare tactics. The sign that I so frequently see posted and slightly paraphrased reads, I expect you to show me the same care that I am showing you. Since we don't share the same perceptions as to what constitutes caring, this would be impossible. Caring in their lexicon means controlling. The mainstream news releases on the so-called COVID-19 virus have all been debunked from many quarters of the globe for many months by countless outstanding microbiologists, physicians, scientists, and whistleblowers. They are our unsung chastised heroes whose descent is quickly labeled and suppressed by global power brokers and sucked up by the subsequent hysteria of the masses. That the Village Council of Yellow Springs, Ohio would take such license with our freedom is something I find extremely insidious. I question the constitutionality of such a military maneuver in the face of the ongoing growing reports about what is actually a threat and what is being presented as a threat. The very real threat is very specifically outlined by Extinction Rebellion America on the following website, xtremamerica.org, along with four demands for government. In addition to the four demands made by Extinction Rebellion, I would like to add several of my own. One, immediately disband the CIA of the United States of America for criminal activity. Two, disarm police officers across America. Our police departments must set a peace-loving, intuitive, non-reactive model. That is not the model suggested by guns. The police need to redefine themselves not as a force, but as a facilitator to humans in need. They need to move from looking for violators and begin looking for where they can assist others who are expressing need for help, such as shelter, food, highway help, a ride to and fro. We human beings are designed for freedom and the ability to become self-governing or being manipulated and paralyzed by fear. Three, nuclear disarmament. How dare we talk about viral threats and AMA agendas when we have been annihilating and eradicating and invading each other? Section number four, immediate disbanding of 5G cell towers that interfere with the health and safety of all living beings. Five, help us to stop rich privilege. Six, help us to reclaim and protect our public domain from the stinking fume of gas engines destroying the biodynamic life of our village. Uh, please hear our plea and please take the necessary action to honor and protect all living beings of goodwill upon the planet Earth, our home. I abbreviated slightly to stay within the three minutes. Okay, thanks for reading that, Judy, and thanks, North Star, for sharing those uh, thoughts. Um, and uh, I also appreciate folks that uh, are, you know, able to wait until we get to the topic about um, uh, meaningful actions with racism. Do we have any other uh, citizen concerns about things that are not on the agenda? Okay. Brian, and, uh, there, were, there were comments that came in through social media. Are we engaging in those tonight? Um, so they're about things that are not related to the agenda? It's related to masks and masks not on the agenda. Um, are, sure, they, are, are they asking to speak to council and identifying themselves? 
Yes, they've identified themselves and they say, I don't have any other way to ask this question since the technical difficulties you have had. Um, okay, let's let's go here. Go ahead. Okay, and hear those. Kate Hamilton, resident. Question, please tell us how you're handling the non-compliant buskers in regards to the mask ordinance. One busker in particular who seems to have had a lot more than one warning. He, he has had many. Right, who who was not busking this past weekend? Go ahead. Uh, that's it. That's the that's the question. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think um, I, I think we've answered how we're addressing that. It's a work in progress, and um, we've got we've got an ordinance. It uh, these things take time, but we're paying attention to them. As I you know mentioned in my uh, earlier comments. Okay, um, so with that, um, let's go ahead and move into our special reports. And I believe first up we have uh, Aaron telling us what's going on with the comprehensive land use plan. Hi, good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm Aaron Sorrell for those uh, listening in with uh, Community Planning Insights. Um, the draft of the comprehensive land use plan is now live at sustainableyellowsprings.com. Um, and what I want to do was go over uh, the, the site and the, the main um, items within that and just uh, and then go over the, the um, uh, process and abilities for people to make comments on the, the draft site. So um, let me share my screen. All right, so um, so not if what you see is a website. Okay, so do you see the website? Okay, very good. Okay, <clears throat> so um, this is the landing page. Um, that describes what the comprehensive plan is. And for those who are watching or listening and, and not well aware of uh, the comprehensive plan, uh, it is a, um, it's a statement of goals, objectives, and policies that guide private or public and private uh, development. It's what provides the policy framework around uh, and, and guides development implementation of the zoning code, subdivision division regulations, uh, classification of streets, uh, public facilities, a dedication of open space, as well as housing and economic development programs. So the characteristics of a comprehensive plan really is, is that they're comprehensive. And, and what I mean by that is they cover the entire jurisdiction and in some cases select areas outside of the jurisdiction. Uh, they're very general. These are high-level policies and goals as opposed to more parcel-based regulations like uh, a zoning code. And they're long-range. A comprehensive plan looks out 10 to 20 years rather than uh, something more immediate. So <clears throat> what, when you visit the, 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 the plan, uh, you will land on what is a comprehensive land use plan. And I'm not going to read everything, but you can scroll through here. Um, and this really talks about why we plan the whole purpose of the comprehensive plan. So we head to the draft. And again, this is a draft. Uh, what I thought I would do, if it was okay, is to um, go through a few of the screens and hit really the key um, priority areas and the policy areas. Uh, and because I know that we only have about 20 minutes, because uh, there's a lot here. Uh, and then get some feedback from, from everybody. So the way I have this drafted at the moment is these are each chapters. Um, so we have community trends, which is essentially demographics, the priorities that we heard through both this community engagement process, but also uh, what was undertaken in 2010 during the vision process. Uh, we have the future land use map and development uh, transportation, housing and neighborhoods, economic development, parks, community character, and public facilities. 
this was the first draft. These were the nine chapters, so to speak, that I thought made sense. Um, if we want to consolidate them, then, then that's perfect. But let me go through um, a few of them. Uh, and then up here, you have the menu that you can always just uh, go to directly to. But again, the landing page, here are the chapters of the plan. There is an implementation um, section, which I'll hit at the end. And then there's also the history. So the planning history of Yellow Springs, and then also the 2010 land use plan as a source of reference, along with all of the uh, various uh, attachments that were there. Um, this is set up for a, a 16 to 9 um, res or, uh, display. So it's more uh, rectangular than it is square, which I think should be fine. But uh, so even folks with a smaller computer uh, should be, uh, be able to see this. But we cover some community trends, some key uh, census population stats, the stats of the, of the village, uh, a little bit of a five-year population projection. Um, it's important to note, the further we are away from the 2010 decennial census, the more the population estimates are gonna be in error. Um, and when we get the new 2020 uh, decennial census counts at the end of the year, if it's on time, uh, then this can all be updated. But community trends, um, one thing I want to note is at the bottom of the, each page, there is a place to make comments. Uh, so the comments on about the plans and the policies uh, can be submitted um, for each section. So under priorities, <clears throat> what, these were the eight large priorities that, that I heard. And these are in no particular order. They're in the order that I typed them out. Uh, so it's just a list. Um, continuing to protect, to protect the surrounding agriculture and rural nature of the area, provide a diverse set of living options, improve our economic diversity and access to jobs, um, protect key environmentally sensitive areas within the village, embrace the uh, values of Yellow Springs when evaluating projects, and maintain uh, the character of Yellow Springs is a small, sustainable village. The idea of remaining small and sustainable uh, carried through almost all of the community engagement um, efforts of what we heard, but there is a recognition that the village does need to grow um, somewhat, and, and it's more of in a stable, managed way, not just unfettered growth uh, and growth for growth sakes. It's, it's, it's deliberate. Uh, encourage diverse transportation infrastructure options, and then also um, co continue to provide high quality public service. When I asked through the process of the 10 land use priorities that were uh, important to the, that were part of the 2010 vision were still important, uh, overwhelmingly um, respondents felt that these sorry, I believe nine, these nine um, development characteristics or development values were still important and still relevant. And so they, they, they form the basis of the future land use plan map. So let's go to that. So th we have both existing and future land use. Um, I'm going to jump to the future land use part. So I have this set up for, in two different ways, and I want your feedback uh, on how you like it. One is there is a land use map that is embedded into the website itself. Um, you can highlight the various um, layers. They're displayed, things of that nature. The other option, which is there for you to look at and comment, is a separate map application that uh, pops up that is a little bit more detailed. Um, and I think it, this is probably a better way to go. It's a little bit more helpful to you. But I do want to talk about the land use, because I think this is the future land use, because this is important. Um, so. 
So this is your existing land use, um, which is largely residential, although 30% since uh, Glen Helen has been annexed into the village, 30% of the land use is uh, open space or parks. The 36% uh, is residential, and that breakdown is, is in the, the plan itself. Um, one of the key recommendations that, that I'm making um, is that we have these future, I'm calling them transition uh, areas, and these are the areas that are uh, outside of the village boundary, but within the urban service boundary. Um, that is one of the key policy recommendations that no development occurs outside of the urban service area. Um, so this is thinking about in the future if development were to occur. So I have two areas that, that are drafted here. One is a west transition. Uh, I'm just calling them for, for a placeholder, the west transitional planning area. Um, that in, and what we are proposing is uh, light industrial uh, outside of, of the village here, uh, really the west of Enon Road. And then to the east, this area where my cursor is, I think that can go either way to light industrial or a residential transition. Right now it's zone industrial in the township, um, but it, there is uh, residential that, that has been looked at to the west or the eastern, excuse me, the eastern edge of it. So depending on market forces, I think it go, can go either way. Um, what will be important is how the edges are treated and making uh, uh, accommodations for uh, connections um, that are consistent with the active transportation plan and the complete streets policy. Um, the only major changes within the urban service boundary or within the actual village is um, the, the current glass farm uh, conservation area is now being uh, mapped as, as park and open space um, just as a future zoning application. Um, to the south is the south land use transition area. Um, so I think there are some opportunities here. If this were to ever transition out of agriculture um, and, and be a potential annexation into the village, I think this northern part offers a great opportunity to expand Gaunt Park. Um, and one of the uh, recommendations I'm also making is there is a change to your subdivision regulations on uh, park parkland dedication. Um, one of the challenges that I think exists in Yellow Springs is there's a lack of office space. Uh, so I, the, the southern end of 68 uh, or Xenia Avenue provides opportunities for the development of office space in the future. Uh, I think one of the, the key takeaways for that area is to make sure that um, that, that the, the commercial uses do not detract from the downtown area. So it's not entertainment or um, uh, restaurants, personal services. This is more of an office or light industrial development. So these are large blobs. Uh, these, these lines are not meant to be hard and fast on the map, but they do uh, align with natural transportation connections. So I'm looking for feedback uh, on, on this as well, as far as these particular land uses. Aaron? Yes. I, I have my uh, laptop open looking at, you know, what you're telling us. And I'm having sort of difficulty moving things around uh, within the within the plan, especially the land use and future land use map. So okay. I, I don't want to get into that now, but it's just I can't quite get to that place where you are. Yeah, um, that. So the one that I opened up, if you go to future land use, all the way at the bottom, click on launch uh, web map application. Oh, okay.
and it should pop open. Well, it's not, but I'm not going to take up the okay. time. I keep, I, I get the whole world coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I got into South America. I, even, I don't know how that happened. But. Well, it, I will look, but it should be set to basically just show the village. <laughs> but I will double check those settings. Okay, thanks. Uh huh. Um, in the the actual text itself on the website, I've described these transitional future land use or transitional future land use districts, um, the potential uses, the areas, uh, et cetera. So take a look at that, see what you think. Um, part of one of the things, let me go back to this map, there are some considerations here of why um, industrial and office are in some and, and not others. So let me flip on a layer just so you see. Your Wellfield Capture Zone is right here. So this is, uh, so the blue line is your five year, well, your one year, your five year. Uh, it's not clear to me that this outer boundary layer, I think it's a 10 year time of travel, um, but from what I can read, it's not well delineated exactly what it is, but I think that's a 10 year time of travel. So I have tried to keep, um, for the most part, whoops, any new uh, industrial uses or those that could potentially pose a problem outside of this the wellhead uh, capture um, gradient. So that's why the industrial uses are suggested to be much further north uh, out of the well field area. Um, so let me go back to some key recommendations here um, on transportation. The, the big item here is integrating the complete streets and the active uh, transportation plan into your thoroughfare plan. Um, that's, that has been done. Um, let me switch gears to transportation. So what is now in your thoroughfare plan? Here are a few changes. Um, in your 2010 thoroughfare plan, Yellow Springs Fairfield Road is uh, indicated as a future um, arterial. I don't think that makes any sense. Um, one, an arterial type of road will completely change the character of Yellow Springs Fairfield Road. Um, and then secondly, I don't think in my lifetime uh, the state's going to change the bridge uh, over for the uh, the um, bikeway, and so the the likelihood of heavy truck traffic using Fairfield Yellow Springs Fairfield Road is is pretty low. So I think it really should be a residential collector, not an arterial. So that's a suggested change. Um, also, then on the thoroughfare plan, we have included um, your existing uh bikeways uh and then all of the active active transportation plan planned improvements as well as suggested bikeway extensions uh, i did not bring these out all the way through into the urban service boundary area so there's some gaps here i can do that if you think it it makes sense but your, uh, your transportation layers now include all of, of that. The other item is that um, when you click on the map, it does then link the recommendations of the active transportation plan to the particular line segments so that you can then uh, show the community uh, progress. So let me go back to, to, to that. So a couple recommendations that I have is adopt the, an updated thoroughfare map that in, incorporates all of the active transporta transportation plan infrastructure. Um, I think there should be another code evaluation and zoning, uh, just like the active transportation plan states to uh, encourage or, or see what areas can be strengthened to uh, encourage uh, biking and walking. And then the last thing that's of note is 
your street network uh, that's laid out had I thought it was more complex than necessary. So I took out some street types. So your street types are, that I'm recommending are now local collector and arterial. Uh, your, your street network isn't that complicated. You didn't need much more of a hierarchy than that. Um, housing is a big topic. Uh, the housing study is incorporated into this draft plan uh, and then anybody who would like they can click here and pull up the actual 2018 housing study um, there is a series of recommendations and uh, priorities that both um, come out of the housing study that are then incorporated into the uh, land use plan uh, comprehensive land use plan as well as some of uh, my experience of, of what i thought uh, should be looked at and including working with the county treasurer to identify tax delinquent vacant lots. Um, accessory dwelling units seem to be a big thing. Uh, it's a big thing nationwide. It it's, can be uh, really good uh, in Yellow Springs. Uh, let's develop a how-to guide, basically uh, a short, uh, easy to, to uh, a brochure in a sense for that. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these, but some big ones. Um, if there is an interest to incent housing development, look at establishing a community re reinvestment area district um, as a potential source of, uh, of gap financing. Um, so I'm not going to read all of these. We're just going to, so I know that we are somewhat short on time. Um, some other key under economic development, I guess a big uh, suggestion that I have. One is in that future land use, make sure that we're not inadvertently uh, compromising the character and critical mass that's downtown by uh, diluting the op diluting that. There is a, a, <clears throat> a map that I put together that might be interesting. You know, downtown is your critical, it is your economic engine. Uh, and so this map just shows the concentration of, of jobs within Yellow Springs and, and so that highlights that. This is another recommendation I have. This um, yellow or this red outline here is, I'm suggesting that you look at, a, at establishing a DORA, which is a designated outdoor ref refreshment area. Uh, this is my draft suggestion of, of the location. As we continue to be required to social distance, uh, this may open up some possibilities for down to better serve the downtown restaurants. Uh, you could set up outdoor seating uh, off premise in a, in a parking lot or uh, Betty Hughes Park that could be a temporary seating that individuals could then take out their, you know, their food and drink and enjoy that socially distanced. Um, Loveland, Ohio recently have, has done that and Loveland is very similar, at least their downtown is very similar to Yellow Springs. That's something if you haven't started to look at, I think it, it makes sense. Um, parks and recreation. So, um, <clears throat> One of the things that I think is worth looking at that, that sooner rather than later is to review your park uh, dedication requirements. Right now, um, you, the subdivision requirements uh, require a 5% dedication of land for any uh, subdivisions that are more than 50 acres. Well, there's no land that can be developed within the village that meets that 50 acre threshold. <laughs> um, so I think that should be looked at to be reduced. Um, even if you don't want the park, uh, it starts a conversation. Uh, and then I think you should look at establishing a fee in lieu of parkland dedication, because there could be uh, uh, areas where uh, a new playground or park isn't necessary because it's adjacent to an existing facility. Uh, and the developer could basically pay a fee into a park fund, which would then upgrade that adjacent park. Um, 
it's just another option that that might that might work. Um, your park master plan was completed in 1998. I think it's time to to update that. And then dog parks were a, a topic. Uh, people wanted to see a dog park uh, being developed, which I think you already are. So. It, it, to, to save time, I'm not going to go through everything. Um, I want you to, for at folks to, to read this, to digest it, to make comments. Again, there's a comment section on every page. Um, and then what I, what I guess I'm looking for feedback from, from council and planning commission is um, how would you like to see the next um, round of public engagements go. There's, we can do this on online, um, or we can uh, set up. I'm going to switch. Uh, Josue, do you want to end my? Let me stop sharing here. There we go. Um, we can continue to take to, to comments online. Uh, I could host uh, virtual sort of public ho open houses uh, online like this that is just dedicated specifically to the comprehensive plan uh, and go over in significant detail. Or um, the option is to do something outside in the next uh, two weeks or so. Within the next two weeks, uh, we could set up some boards in one of the parks. You know, you're always subject to the weather, but um, that's just how it that's just the risk you take. Um, I'm completely open to the what you would like to see next. Josue? All right, Brian, I'm here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Aaron. Excellent presentation. I hope that Planning Commission, Council, and our citizens appreciate the effort that has gone into this to make it accessible, to make it an organic document that lives on a website, it's interactable. Um, the, what Aaron has been able to do with the zoning map and layering it, so you'll see our active transportation plan and all our current plan, the proposed plan, and all those things are, are interactable. So they're not on a PDF file that it's difficult to sort through. It's all live, it's interactive. And so we welcome your feedback. This is the time to um, provide comments and feedback on this great work that we're doing um, as this is going to shape our future. We've got more to talk about later in, in, uh, regarding active transportation plan. We have great news. And uh, I, I make reference to that because as we put it together, uh, we're going to see it come, some of that come reality right in the near future. And if I could say one other thing, if there are if there's other data or other layers that I don't have on here that you think would be helpful, just let me know and I'll either create it or put them in. There's a good chance I already made it. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I, I, you know, I want to say like I uh, totally agree. Great presentation. This is really exciting, and uh, I appreciate the pro approach you have taken. Um, so I guess one thing that occurs to me, and you know, we don't have a lot of time to talk about this uh, at this meeting, but I love the idea of some kind of you know setting up outside engagement if we can make that happen um, in the near future. Uh, I think the other thing that occurs to me to your question about you know is there anything missing is you know doing one additional push to folks just to say, hey, here's what we've captured um, and, and really encourage through our social media and website and other channels to do that. Um, but I guess ultimately I think our next step is to have that um, you know, sort of public unveiling or whatever we want to call it and however we structure that um, to you know, start sort of formalizing and, and moving forward because I think uh, some excellent work has been done. There's been a lot of opportunity for feedback, but I love the idea of like thinking about one more, you know, sort of here's the final draft. Uh, what are your thoughts? So, Brian, yes, or Aaron, do you hear me? Yeah, sorry, my uh, dog is barking. So. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> 
where are you in Paris or, or Venice or something? Um, I'd like if if there's a way we could do this outside. I think that would be great. We've talked about maybe getting a tent. And I don't know if we could spring for the amount of money that it would cost to have a tent big enough to to host this. But uh, if we could, if that were possible some way to have it undercover like that, I think it would be a great way to bring people together to see it and really help educate people about what what this is about. Yeah, I think, you know, it's probably okay to roll the dice on rain. Um, we just haven't had that much recently. Um, I think Denise said that there was a, a covered shelter at, at Ellis Park. Uh, but what I'm thinking is a number of stations that basically all have the same information so that um, people don't have to gather around one particular map. Uh, we could put it along the bikeway maybe, um, or use Mills Lawn. Um, that area is, is big. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity that, that that we could do, pull something quickly together yeah. in the next 14 days or so. Um, I saw Matthew Kirk just po uh, posted something, but we could do it maybe on Mills Lawn, sort of like the storyboard thing, right. you know, people walking around. So, yeah, so I guess I'd like to ask, I know we've had a, a steering committee that have you know been working on this. So if that group wants to kind of help set that up, or if not, it sounds yeah. like Karen Wintrow and, you know, our staff have some ideas that could work with Aaron. So uh, let's figure that out. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's implement it in the next couple of weeks if we can. Yeah, and, and I'll also uh, get with everybody to set up some virtual times um, so that, you know, we'll take a deep dive into the plan online for those who are uncomfortable about being outside. That sounds great. Okay, so I think uh, awesome report. Aaron, you're doing a great job. Um, and so, yeah, so I think uh, most way, I think you can help uh, orchestrate the next steps with this and we've got some good ideas and some people that I think are willing to uh to help so with that yes. let's try yeah go ahead no I just said yes we'll we'll take care of it we we've awesome. been in discussion with Aaron about the next steps sweet love it um hey so let's transition into uh some of the most exciting news I've heard uh in a period where we need some good news which is the village got 1.6 million to support active transportation. I mean, this is unheard of since I've been on council and uh, I'm really excited to hear um, uh, Johnny Burns, Denise Swinger and Josue Salmaran tell us about uh, how this happened. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. And we've, I'm gonna share a PowerPoint presentation that we have that's included in your packet. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank Johnny and Denise for working diligently and getting us this $1.6 million for our active, active transportation plan initiative. So I mentioned earlier, you know, these documents that we're working on now are helping shape the future. So the work that council, the team here, and our citizens did um, a little over a year ago, or it's paying off. We've or managed to secure $1.6 million for projects that are gonna significantly enhance the way our residents and visitors move through, through the village. It's gonna improve safety and it's gonna add so much value to our community. So I'll highlight the, what does it look like uh, in the near future. So for 2021, we'll kick off the preliminary engineering, totally 91,000. Then we've got a detailed design that's gonna take place in 2022. And in 2023, we start the construction. We'll have some right away work to do. Um, we got some, and we got construction in 2023 that's going to be around 1.4 million dollars. All right. Um, I'm going to show the slides that we submitted to ODOT uh, for our presentation because it has a great summary of the of all of our projects. 
there's a history about us and what we submitted to ODOT um, about the team. We've got a very talented team here with Denise and Johnny. Project background, this is specifically to uh, address some of the, the pedestrian and bicycle uh, challenges that we have. And we've got also the opportunities that we have. One of the things that makes us attractive is that we're so, uh, our walkability and, and the, how bike friendly we are. So the recommendations in the active transportation plan, there are 11 improvements in total, five of which are priority one recommendations, three are priority three recommendations, and the approach to the work is a systemic one. And the improvement along primary routes in the village, that being Dayton Street and Xenia Avenue, the Little Miami Sydney Trail Crossing, Corey Street Crossing, this is the connection to Little Miami on Corey Street. And I have a map, we have a map later on um, that uh, we can uh, show you a visual visual representation of what, of what um, that work is going to go on there. What are our existing conditions? We've on Dayton Street, the Dayton Street corridor. It's a major collector. We got supposed to post a speed of 35 miles an hour, and that road has 6,700 vehicles per day. It's a two-lane road roadway. Zena Avenue, which is our uh, US 68 corridor, is a principal arterial road with a speed limit of 25 to 35 miles per hour. And that has a volume of 5,600 to 9,000 vehicles per day. So a lot of traffic there. Um, so this highlights the need on why we need to improve the safety of those crossings there for pedestrians and cyclists. So what are the countermeasures? Reconstruct multi-youth path along, uh, along Dayton Street from Enon Road to Elm Street. Curb extension high visibility crosswalk markings and signs at five intersections along Dane Street and Xenia Avenue. Improve Little Miami Crossing. Uh, these are two RRFDs, um, high visible markings. These are those flashing lights that you see uh, at intersections. So if a user wants to, pedestrian wants to cross the street, they can press the button, light, uh, the lights go off indicating to the vehicles that someone wants to cross the, the street. And so it gives them the signal. Redesigning the curb and reduce crossing distance at Xenia Avenue and Corey Street. Provide sidewalk trail connectivity to the Little Miami uh, Trail from East Limestone Street and Glen Street, including the RRFDs and crosswalks on Corey Street. All right, so here's a map. The stars indicate all these the different areas that we'll be working on. And the yellow, the yellow line or dark yellow line is the reconstruction of that shared bike path. So this is a summary of our presentation. Johnny, Denise, anything you would like to add? Um, just that this is, uh, if, if council, some council members may recall, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, we came asking for a resolution uh, to submit this project uh, through um, another grant source, and we didn't get that, and that and that had a significant match. What's really exciting about this this time around is um, this is a safety grant that just came out, um, uh, and was we heard about it through uh, MVRPC, and it's no match. So it's 100% funded uh, all of these improvements. So I guess in the long run, it, it probably was a good thing that we didn't get the last one because uh, we now are able to do this and it's not gonna cost the village um, anything other than what we've already put into it for some preliminary uh, engineering work. I also think it's good to note that this is this was a start of the grant that we was given for the active transportation, and they see the state sees that we're following through what they entrusted us with the money for. That's a good point. Yeah, I'll just I'll jump in, Johnny. I appreciate you emphasizing that because this has been a whole process that started with Chris Bongiorno and the active transportation committee that was ad hoc, like recognizing this opportunity, getting us on the radar with ODOT and Department of Health 
that really has set this all off. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the the village team embracing, you know, that plan and, you know, pursuing this funding, which, you know, is really what we were set up to do in the first place. So thanks for emphasizing that. Okay, do we have uh, any questions from council members or comments? Laura? I just have a question. Uh, the Xenia at Corey, um, there, for northbound traffic on 68, there's Xenia, there's something like an informal turn lane onto Corey going towards Dayton. I'm just wondering, it, that seems very useful to keep traffic moving through the downtown. Hopefully not at, you know, we can do some of that calming, but that, that de facto turn lane, will that be going away? I, I am trying to visualize which lane are you talking about? Like right at sub, that subway, like people turning toward the post office, that part of Cory. If northbound traffic turning left, going towards Dayton. You know, there's trap, like if somebody wants to turn left, the traffic usually is going around them. There's like a turn, there is no real turn lane, but people treat it that way because it's so wide. And I, under, I understand the need to shorten distances for pedestrians. It's just a very handy left-hand turn lane that's there that isn't marked. Thank you. Johnny, unless you have something now, I think that's something that we'll, we'll have. We'll look into it. Yep. Thank you, Laura. Okay, anything else? All right, well, I've just gotta say, you guys are awesome. I mean, yeah, uh, it, it is, it's so cool to see, you know, what happens when you develop a plan and, uh, and we're doing this on so many levels with our infrastructure and seeing the payoff. So thanks to the village team for all the hard work and, uh, and we're seeing it pay off and it's gonna, not only contribute to our you know, safety, but also to our quality of life. So uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Brian. I, I was double muted. I was just gonna say, I wish we were all together so we could really celebrate this and really wanna thank the team that worked on this, like Denise and Johnny and Josue. This is wonderful news and we need some wonderful news. So thank you. All right. Um, okay, so we're going to move into old business and um, uh, a topic that we did not get to at our last meeting, which we want to make sure to uh, have ample time for is meaningful action related to um, uh, anti-racism. Uh, I think most people know that uh, last month we passed a resolution declaring racism as a public health emergency, and we are we have been and you know, are prioritizing commitment to um, meaningful action to address this. And um, the way I'd like to structure this conversation, um, Lisa and Mary Ann submitted um, uh, written documents that I would like them to be able to highlight. Um, I would also, uh, I, I think embodied in Laura Curlis's letter are some uh, important issues too. So I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to briefly highlight some things. Uh, then it's clear that we've got citizens that would like to speak. And then ultimately, we're gonna end this conversation by um, creating a list of things that we're gonna start moving forward. So um, uh, Mary Ann McQueen, why don't you start the conversation? Okay, uh, I, I will speak briefly about the paper that I wrote and I also wanna talk about a restorative justice effort that I've been working on more immediately. So what, what I was suggesting was that this is a great time to rethink public safety. And that is primarily at this point being performed by our police department. And uh, histor because of historical forces, um, who the, the overarching concept of policing, or at least some of that concept, 
has really been antithetical, I would say, to public safety and public health. And so I am suggesting that we really look at what are the needs of the community. And that, that means, in large part, what are the police actually doing? And then make decisions on, do we have the right people? Do the people have the right skills? Do we have the right concept? Do we have the right plans and policies in place to have those actions be done well? Because I'm proposing, and it's borne out nationally, that only a very small part of police time nationally is spent on violent crime. And uh, e even below that, you know, traffic things and sort of minor things are, are, are much different. I, and I'm suggesting that that be the first step that we look at what are the services that we need? Well, how are they being performed? How can we do a better job of doing that? And who should be doing that? And the second thing I'm suggesting is that as much as possible, disarm the police, uh, carrying guns, having those uh, vests that they wear, all of that, at minimum, it gives, it, well, it certainly must be uncomfortable, but at minimum, it gives a an air of, I can use force if I need to, and I can use force against you. And of course, at the other end, and I'm not suggesting that it happens with our department because it's rare that it does. Um, it can lead to death people, or people getting hurt. Um, and when it's, I think that for the most part, it's not necessary. And the third thing that I suggested was that, well, we certainly have issues in the village and it's our responsibility as council and our responsibility as village government to focus on our community, clearly. But we, are, we aren't an island. We're part of, of this nation, which has, in terms of racism, has, is, is historically based on racism. And to really have a, a broader impact I am suggesting that village government in the form of village council or whether it's uh, the, one of our advisory boards really look to see how we can impact at the county and the state level in particular. And we already have a group that's working on jail prison reform and Laura's letter has mentioned um, some other things. So that, that's that piece. I would just like to briefly say that I've also been talking with, uh, with Josue and the chief, John Gudgel, uh, Angela Allen, uh, Jennifer Bierman, I've reached out to Bomani to uh, try to do what a restorative justice circle uh, and by that, what I'm talking, I'm not talking about restorative justice in the sense of having a crime happen. I'm talking about restorative justice as it's really based in have a whole community. And if there are breaches or bro some brokenness in the community, a way of bringing people together in a circle to talk about it. So um, I think that maybe some of the people that are listening to our council meeting may have be some of the people that have been involved in the recent demonstrations and marches. And my hope is that we can have such a circle with some of the uh, particular young people that have been leading these with some people from village government to talk about our joint concerns and, and to talk about issues that, that the people doing the demonstrations have been having and some issues that uh, the village government has been having. So. That's what I'll say about that for now. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Marianne. Um, Laura Curlis. Yes, thank you. So I submitted a, a letter to Governor DeWine for council's consideration I, a couple of weeks ago because he said he was going to be proposing some legislative changes around specifically policing. 
And as Mary Ann said, um, we aren't an island. We are living in a context where other state agencies, federal agencies, other entities um, do a lot to influence how, how we police at the local level. So my letter, and it's it, in the packet pages 153 to 155, I touch on some of the best reform ideas I've seen coming from people in the state, the a couple of different legislative caucuses, the ACLU, other, other places, um, scholars, anyway, and I grouped them into five areas, uh, changes in hiring practices at the state level that could help us on the local level, training, how police are trained, you know, they really receive very little training for what we ask them to do. And that training at the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy, that could be improved greatly. And then that also trickles down to the local level to um, what happens in these kind of training courses, uh, even here in Greene County. Um, there are legal changes that can happen again, and, and many of these you've heard in the national conversation around qualified immunity, um, how excess use of force cases are handled, um, eliminating many dangerous practices that also I feel will, will make our police officers safer by eliminating, um, you know, you've, you've read about many of these banning no-knock warrants, chokeholds, et cetera. Decarceration measures, mass incarceration, again, is very well known, and um, we need to reduce the prison populations. There's much that can be done there. Again, that comes down, there's, there's a lot of factors dri driving what, ha even with our own mask ordinance, you know, there's this inclination to criminalize everything and, and start to send people into the pipeline to prison, and we have to stop doing that. Alternatives to armed policing, which is what Marianne just talked about. So anyway, my letter's there. I'm encouraged. Now, council could send this or the new Justice System Advisory Committee. I'd love it if they would review it and maybe make improvements to my letter uh, and then maybe bring it back to council. Maybe they want to add their names to it. But I would like to get this to the governor as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, Lisa, Kerr, uh, Lisa Krieger? Um, you know, I am going to highlight maybe things that I um, am recommending in just a little bit different words. In the interest of time, though, I just want to thank my colleagues, uh, Marianne and, and Laura. I think there's a lot of synergy in our ideas. And Laura, I think that um, letter is really fantastic. So thank you for writing it. It was truly inspiring to read it in the packet. Um, you know, I too have been focusing on research, also um, talking with lots of folks on the advisory, beginning work on the citizen review process, and also um, emerging the Art and Culture Commission, emerging from our COVID hiatus to consider how public art can be um, a means of, of activism. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the uh, ever popular Short Street Dialogue. Um, I, I really am coming at uh, what we might do. I think about the work that the council can do, you know, um, and then the work that we do in collaboration with community members and then what can, um, you know, advisory and commissions do. Um, I think most importantly, we know that before we know it, the village council is going to be working on budget again. And I think, you know, our ability to look at and uh, put a very sharp pencil on, on budget issues are, are really, really critical. And I'm very much looking forward um, to thinking about how we can reconfigure and think about our budget in such a way that we can create a second full time community outreach coordinator position in addition to a full-time position uh, for our, our current position. And I understand this could lead to cuts in other areas, but I believe that that community outreach coordinator positions are absolutely cr critical. Um, I also, in my memo, address the same 
um, point about lethal force, force that's already been discussed, also hiring and training, um, also um, decriminalization. I list a few behaviors. Um, and then also the um, evaluation process and aligning um, those to the guidelines for policing. And I, I know that some of this work has already begun. I know that Josue and Chief Carlson are already um, on working on that and are beginning to engage some interested community um, members. So I'm glad that we're starting to move quickly on that. And, uh, you know, I just know that it, it can be difficult to reimagine changes because we, um, even those of us who are old, um, we, we grew up with these systems of power that have been in, in place for hundreds of years. And so I think right now we have the right energy, we have the right youth, we have the right wisdom that I think we can really make deeper reforms. And uh, I think we need to put our, our money in support of our values on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, okay, so I know uh, I have on my list uh, Naya, Julian, and Julia. If uh, other folks want to comment, feel free to let me know in the chat or raise a hand on Zoom um, or whatever else. But uh, Naya, I'm going to give you the, the mic next. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, like I said, my name is Naya Brevik. I am a local demonstrator and a recent high school graduate. Um, for the past few weeks, I have been organizing rallies in town, and for the most part, they have been met with support from the community. However, I think it is important to see more support from the Village Council. Racism was recently deemed a public health crisis in Yellow Springs, but I've, up until this point, I've seen little to no action taken to truly make that statement anything more than performative. As a young Black woman in this town, it is important to me that I know without a shadow of a doubt that my local officials will be there to support me in this movement. I need to know that there are real actions being taken every day to make Yellow Springs a more accepting and safer place for its black and brown citizens. I've lived in six states all across the country and I've experienced racism in over and covert forms. Yellow Springs, while preaching inclusivity and acceptance, still has some clear deep-rooted conservative and racist ideals that need to be addressed. I want, the, I want to know that the village is working towards acknowledging, addressing, and actively working towards fixing these issues. I want to know that the village is working towards fixing these issues and repairing the community, not only when it is convenient for them, but in everything they do. If racism is truly a crisis to the village, I want to see it treated like one. Thank you. Thanks, Naya. Well stated. Uh, Julian. Thank you. My name is Julian, and I have written this letter on behalf of myself and others in concern of the disheartening information in relation to recent weekly demonstrations after being as compliant as possible while trying to spread an important message. To the Village Council and the Yellow Springs Police Department, we as local demonstrators have become increasingly concerned about issues of systemic racism across the United States. To bring awareness to this issue after George Floyd was murdered, we decided to hold weekly rallies that have been followed by Black Lives Matter's protests. Although our village has not necessarily seen brutality rates comparable to neighboring larger areas, the problem of systemic racism is bigger than our village, and our goal is to keep people educated on what it's like to be black in America while also spreading awareness by marching down the state route to maximize the number of people that see our message. Yellow Springs prides itself on, accepting, on being an accepting community for all, but unfortunately, the support from some members of the community has not remained. On top of this, racism has recently been deemed a public health crisis in Yellow Springs, but this announcement has not been followed with action. Specifically, we are concerned about the call that the chief made with a self-proclaimed KKK member about the parade being canceled, as mentioned in the July 2nd edition of the YS News, um, called Parade Canceled After the KKK Threat which is backed by an audio recording. In this recording that is public record, the chief thanks the alleged KKK member for his expressed support. The response to this threat made by the KKK is extremely concerning as the chief is in charge of an entire police force. This is an absolute dismissal of the declaration of racism as a public health crisis. This also raises concerns about the village council who may be aware of the chief's recent interactions with both the Black Lives Matter protesters and the supposed KKK member. With this, we as demonstrators have a list of demands for the village of Yellow Springs to ensure the safety of black and brown people. Below, I have a list that we wish to see through. One, 
admit that there was an error in judgment that has taken place in the past few weeks. Part A of this is, and most importantly, include an analysis of the Yellow Springs Police the police department, specifically an analysis of the recent phone calls that Chief Carlson has made with an alleged KKK member. Part B, address the lack of urgency against threats made from a um, member of a terrorist organization against members of the community. Part C, this also includes the council um, undermining everything that has uh, that have announced that they have announced publicly by reaching out to other village members in an attempt to silence the organizers. Um, two put substance behind the announcement of racism being a public health crisis. Step needs, steps need to be taken immediately to show a plan of action. Part A, be in attendance of the rallies and or protests, showing support that is not negated by complaints of inconveniences of protests that have um, been happening in the town. Part B, reallocating funds and resources to address the public health crisis. And Part C, publicly expressing what you have done to make change in hopes that this will cause a ripple effect and inspire other people in the community to stand up for justice. Um, the third point is to hold officers, council members, all elected officials and teachers accountable for their actions and assure that they are consistently being checked for bias. Um, part A of this is ongoing or regular implicit bias training um, that should be given to all people who hold powerful positions in the community. Part B is actively work to ensure that implicit biases are questioned and countered in every decision, legislation, and educational curriculum made for the village in the future. We ask that you provide both a public and a private report in the next 48 hours. Sincerely, the demonstrators. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thanks, Julian. Uh, Julia. Hello, thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Julia Hoff and I am a recent Yellow Springs High School graduate and I'm one of the many organizers of the various Black Lives Matter protests here in Yellow Springs. I'm here today to address something that I've seen much more of lately in our community and that is the performative activism, specifically white performative activism and allyship. Growing up in Yale Springs, I've seen instances of inclusivity, love, acceptance, and progressive actions taken by the village and by the YSPD. I have also seen, especially more recently in regards to the village, the more performative side of our town. If in Yellow Springs, racism has been deemed a public health crisis, why has there not been the same amount of attention given and action taken against racism in comparison to COVID-19? The first three to four weeks of protesting, we had numbers in the hundreds, and now we are lucky to have 50 people show up. There is a bigger issue here that needs to be addressed. I am not here today to tell you what to do, but to ask the hard questions. What are we as a predominantly white village going to do to address the systemic racism that many of us benefit from? How are we as a village going to support, uplift, hire, elect, et cetera, black people and black voices in our community, in our school systems, and in this very council? How are we as a village going to actively take a stand against racism? And why are we so easily intimidated when confronted with the possibility of racist terrorist organizations such as the KKK? To all of the white people here today, anti-racism is not supposed to make us comfortable. If you've been feeling a lack of comfort lately, that's good. We need to sit in it, reflect upon it, and learn from it. And if you're a villager watching this right now that does not know how to help or how to make a change, then you should start by showing up. The rallies that we've been organizing have been informative, educational, inspirational, and we're trying to keep the momentum. But we will lose it unless the people of Yellow Springs show up and show that our desire for change is more than just our posts on social media show up and take action and let us not back down from this fight. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. And, you know, I want to say to Julia, Julian, and Naya that, um, I, and I think I'm representing everyone, like, it's so amazing to have you guys in our meeting, being so articulate and highlighting your concerns, um, which really ties into the way that we need to move forward with, uh, with, meaningful change. So, uh, so I just want to say, yeah, thanks for waiting it out. Thanks for being authentic. And uh, it, it really makes a difference. Uh, Basim, did I see you wanted to comment? Yes. Uh, can you guys hear me? Um, just wanted to say um, thank you to this wonderful village council. I've been here for seven years now and um, you guys have done a wonderful job in making Yellow Springs a wonderful place for me and my family, and I'm thankful for that. 
and uh, also thankful uh, to the young people I've been coming to the marches over the last couple of weeks and thankful even to our, our local police who've been providing uh, protection and security. That's one of the reasons I go because I'm older and I just want to be there um, just in case um, things get out of hand. Um, and just, you know, as a, as a young, as a man, I'm just like, you know, I want to be there to protect these young people. And that's why I show up. And every week they always give someone the mic and they ask you to talk about what action item you're going to do to make Yellow Springs a better place. And so I took the microphone at the last meeting and I said, I'm going to confront my wonderful village council that I respect and admire so much about why it is that in the seven years I've lived here, I have yet to see um, a person that looks like me working on any type of government or municipal contracting job in the city. Um, and I wonder, like, sometimes how does the Klan know what we're doing in Little Yellow Springs? Well, it seems like, and let me know if I'm wrong, there's 100% um, white men that get these contracting jobs to dig these holes in the street. I don't know what they're doing because I don't, I don't know anything about contracting. I work in radio. But um, I have yet to see a person of color do any type of contracting work for the village and it's so awesome to be in today's meeting and to hear this good news about ODOT giving Yellow Springs $1.8 million. And I wonder how much of that money, if we, if we are really against um, racist and bias and racism and systemic racism, how, how much of that money will be spent on 100% white companies? Now, I know in um, San Antonio, in Berea, Kentucky, and Asheville, North Carolina, and, and, and other cities that I've been to, that they have set aside a certain amount of spending that'll be spent with minority-owned contractors and businesses. And I want to know if Yellow Springs has anything like that. I don't know, and I guess I want to ask a question. Is there any contact? Or, or information out there for minority-owned companies in our area to bid on local village contracts. Thanks, Basim. I, I'll give you a short answer, and we will follow up on it. But it is something that since Judah Templing was on council, and we made one of our village values highlighting anti-racism, that we have been working towards you know being more active in terms of you know how our hiring practices and everything um, but I can also say we can do better so it's a great comment and and we will follow up on how we're looking at that um, at the next meeting I think that's something that the young people might want to know I know my teenager yep. showed me this app on my phone that um, if I wanted to get a sandwich tonight or hire a plumber there's an app that I can use to see where's the closest black business um, that offers that service. So I can say, well, I might want to use them tonight to order a pizza, or uh, I, I may not. Um, so I think the village has to have some type of network or contact of who are the local minority businesses in this community. And as a person of color, it's, it is racist to every time I get walk out of my house or see people working on the plumbing or in the streets or on these uh, plans for residential industrial you want to development. They are all white men. But and it's, it's got water. Good. That's the most important. I'm, I'm, excuse me. I'm sorry. Did someone say something? Sorry, but see, we had a constituent on mute themselves. Okay. I, I muted them. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Um, it really is hurtful because it doesn't seem like there's been any um, substantial movements to share the wealth, give people of color and minority-owned businesses access to work in this village. And that would mean a lot to me, and I think a lot to our community, because we're putting our dollars where our words are and really having a meaningful change. I mean, we're not asking for uh, the Confederate flag to come down. We're not asking for 
Some, but this is something that's substantial. Hire people of color with these contracts in the village. And thank you for listening to me. Yeah, thank you, Basim. I, you know, I'll say like in relation to this, you know, not only, you know, will we be more intentional and look at those opportunities, but we've been talking with our new village solicitor about making sure that anyone that works with the village also follows our village values. So anyone that's, you know, racist, homophobic, you know, cannot like, you know, establish that they're in line with what our, you know, values are as a welcoming community, we don't want to work with. So totally on point, and I appreciate those comments. I, I've seen a Confederate flag um, bumper sticker and a Trump Pence bumper sticker on some of these vehicles of some of these people that come to work in the village, and that's what I've seen. Okay. Yep, thank you. Um, all right, do we have any other folks that would like to comment? Not seeing anything in the Brian, chat. Brian, you've got someone who says they would like to comment. There's no name. It just says user. Uh, yeah, that was Basim. Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, all right. Uh, Brian, they... I, think, I think there's one more, May, May D. And, uh, yes, and I please. Want to say something. Okay. Great. Go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Jen Boyer. And uh, well done, Basim. I 100% agree. Uh, lately, Yellow Springs has experienced increased pressure due to our mask ordinance. We as a village took a stance, a stance I believe in and support, a stance to respect science and care about our neighbors, come together for our collective health. But when one man using a fake name and cl claiming to represent the KKK threatened to counter protest our weekly demonstrations, the support that support that the Black Lives Matter movement and speaking out against systemic racism, I was deeply disturbed by the Village and PD response. Our rallies have been positive. Our gatherings have celebrated black culture, black women, black arts, and black leaders. Many in our community have participated in our demonstrations and shown support. One weak, angry man, afraid to state his real name, hiding behind an alias, makes one phone call of showing up with the KKK and our insurance to march is pulled with significant pushback. I believe this, and this moment in time is very unique. This moment is powerful. The nation is struggling with intense uncertainty and pressure following the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. There is a powerful momentum. Yellow Springs had the opportunity to push back to speak out and stand up against a potential KKK counter protest or to simply gather as planned and stand against systemic racism. Instead, we canceled. We gave the caller exactly what he wanted. This is not the Yellow Springs I know and love. We can certainly do better. That's all. Thanks, Jen. Um, you know, I think that uh, we will follow up with a, a statement about, um, I think, the confusion related to the KKK incident. But what I will say is that um, the village did not pull anything. Um, we were not organizing the 4th of July parade, and, and we've been supporting but have not um, you know, been the lead organizer for any of the protests. Um, so, you know, I did want to comment on that, but I think that um, we'll make sure to help clarify what has gone on there. Um, but I will say the ultimate goal was safety for our community and de-escalation. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't things to explore and learn from that. Um, Brian, all right. Yes, Marianne. May I say something in that regard? Sure. Because I was one of the people organizing the, the 4th of July parade that did not happen. And uh, there, well, Mayor Knine, myself, and Mike Miller, Bomani, well, he could speak for himself, but Mike, uh, the mayor, and myself. And the primary reason, well, the, the first reason was that B Bomani was concerned that having a 4th of July parade that was uh, in line with Black Lives Matter was not really to be supported by the 
older black community. The second reason, and the one that I think really was the reason why we did not have it, was because for whatever reason, it got into the Springfield and the Dayton paper. And once that happened, we felt like it was not, would no longer be a Yellow Springs parade. It would be attracting people from Dayton and Springfield. And we just didn't think, one, it wouldn't be what we wanted it to be, and two, it wouldn't be safe, not, not anything about, this was before the KKK thing, that it wouldn't uh, be safe in terms of social distancing. So the KKK thing happened after, really after that decision about leaving. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, Bomani, I saw you would like to make a comment. And you're on mute. Okay. Uh, so I'd just like to uh, appreciate this forum and the uh, young ladies that, you know, kind of share from our perspective as from organizing these rallies and making some observations over the last several weeks. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what this so-called uh, restorative justice circle is about, but uh, when I search when I search the internet for restorative justice, everything I come up with indicates there's a response to a crime that's been committed. And I know, Marianne, you say like this, you know, really isn't like that type of situation. But I do know that when, uh, after the first uh, week, there was a spontaneous march. I got phone calls uh, practically demanding to put in for a permit uh, because they were on the state route, <clears throat> I feel like, you know, I got, got my arm twisted, like, uh, pretty good. And I know there's, uh, concerns. I was told that, you know, it's a state highway and you had to have a permit to, to close it down. So my concern is, is like, there's, uh, somewhere in the background, this leverage that the marches, the people on these marches have been committing this crime by marching up the state highway. And that's going to come up uh, somewhere in this restorative justice. I mean, if, if there's no crime that's being committed and that's what you're purporting, then you need to call it something besides the restorative justice uh, circle because everything I see in, indicates that it's in response to a crime that's been committed. And I know I won't participate in, in it if you're gonna to continue to call it that, because I'm gonna be like real leery about what's lurking in the background. May I respond, Brian? Sure. Yeah. Okay. The restorative justice movement really has grown out of indigenous cultures, including indigenous cultures in Africa, uh, uh, Raymond Ruka from uh, Australia or New Zealand, Australia, Native American cultures, where people sit in a circle and pass a stick and listen to each other, and everyone's truth is valued. It's true, restorative justice has more recently been used. In, uh, in criminal cases as a means of, uh, well, in different ways. But last year, uh, Jalen Rowe and uh, Jennifer Bierman did a workshop on restorative justice circles. And a, a number of people in the village and people from outside of the village attended it. What, what you do is you have two people who facilitate it and they're just there to hold the space and people talk about what's been going on for them. And if there are problems, they try to have a conversation about how to reach agreement. So for example, right now, this isn't really a great mechanism to deal with some of the issues that have been raised in the last 15 minutes. But 
sitting, for example, if we could do this in the gym and uh, socially distance, would be an opportunity for people to be actually physically together. So we could call it a listening circle. We could call it time for people to gather together in a circle and listen to what other each other's concerns are. Thanks. So I'm fine with gathering to not discuss the issues, just uh, the whole the title, restorative justice, and uh, mm -hmm. indicated most recently it's, it's uh, been used to resolve, to respond to criminal issues. So that just makes me leery. And Bomani, I appreciate you highlighting that. I mean, I think, you know, emphasizing that it's, you know, a listening exercise and, 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 you know, I think, I think the language and the intention around it is really important. So appreciate that. Um, we're going to wrap this conversation up, but I did see that Naya wanted to make a quick closing comment and then we're going to talk about next steps. So Naya, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Just really quick. I wanted to, um, mention from what I heard within the because I listened to the audio recording um, of the phone call from what I heard the way the phone call was phrased that um, the parade was canceled kind of in response to the call that was made from the um, self-proclaimed KKK member so for me what made me uncomfortable was just the the tone of voice um, from Chief Carlson and the way it was presented to the proclaimed KKK member. For me, just as a black woman, I want to know that the person in charge of protecting me and my community isn't going to try and appease um, someone that is a member of a terrorist organization because I see what's happening to my people across the country. Like people are being killed, especially protest leaders and organizers are being literally murdered. So when met with a threat from someone in a terrorist organization, I'd like to know that there's a little Yes, de-escalization is important, but also I want to know that that's not going to be um, tolerated in this community, just for my own safety and the safety of my other organizers. So that's all I had to say. Thanks, Naya. And I think that's a good way to, to kind of- um, Brian, you know, may, I, may I? Um, yeah, Hostway, go ahead. Uh, Naya, Julian, Julie, I appreciate all that you're doing. It, it warms my heart. It makes me feel proud to see that you and this generation take an action and what youth around the country has done in the recent weeks, uh, they have accomplished more than what many of the politicians, leaders have tried doing in years. So I want to say thank you for what you guys are doing and for what youth are doing throughout the country. I recognize the pain and how all the, the issues you've had with phone calls and all of these things that have led up to, to uh, recent actions. As a brown person myself, I know that I've experienced discrimination, not just here, but where I was born. I was not born in this country. Um, I came here to this country actually as an undocumented kid, unaccompanied minor. Uh, so I know some of the injustice. Um, and so I, I'm really proud to see of all the work that you guys are doing and trust that the folks here in the administration, we have our community's interest at the forefront of everything. As you talk about, it breaks my heart to hear how folks have taken this call with the KKK member as conciliatory or appeasing because we put a lot of effort into how we were gonna manage the situation. And the situation was just not some asshole calling us to say that they're coming into town and, and, and create chaos. But we were monitoring the situation, not just here, but in other areas. And we had reason to believe, and we had pretty good intel that, they, that, we were, that there were threats and we were concerned about the safety of our, of our residents. Um, so we went through, through a lot of effort to identify all the threats and try to put uh, measures in place to ensure the safety of our residents. You guys may not see it and that's on purpose. We wanna be outside of the, uh, uh, the front lines 
Um, but w there's a lot of effort that we put behind all the the manifestation that are taking place, which have been eight, eight weekends in, in a consecutive weekend. Um, and we've gone through a lot of effort to make sure that we have the right resources to be able to protect the road for safety. And particular incidents, we've had uh, the surrounding law enforcement agencies on tier one on high alert that something could happen in the region and we needed folks to be able to respond to our community if we had a serious threat. Um, so a lot of efforts we put in there. We had in, in no way, I personally am, I test it. I find it awful that we have uh, KKK in our region. We have white supremacy sentiment uh, in Greene County and maybe even in our town. And I, I personally have been raised in a family in this community. I find that threatening. And I find it threatening for our residents. Um, with this particular call that you that you reference, you know, the, the we strategize about how we're going to manage it. And not that we wanted to highlight the importance of this individual, um, but we we have our, our primary concern is the safety of our residents. And we want to be resolution oriented. And you know, we didn't we didn't want folks coming here and create chaos. We care about the safety of our folks here. And you know, they don't have to come in groups, but just one is a threat to create chaos. Um, so those folks are not welcome here. And we reached out to make sure that this isn't happening and they're not welcome here. Um, now, I wanna reassure you that their call um, it's not what council what council did July 4th. I think you've heard Brian Hausch and Mary Emma Queen and others talk about this. Um, there were uh, several other factors that were involved um, in making that decision and, and we were not part of it. Um, but we were prepared to provide all the support and safety for the 4th of July and other events that were scheduled. Um, and I hope that you've seen our commitment. I have been out there seven weekends in a row. This is the the, first, the last weekend was the first weekend that I missed. Um, but I was out there personally, seven weekends in a row to not only provide support, but make sure that we, as your public servants, we work for you, that we are providing the safety uh, and security that, that you deserve. And I could go on, but I know we're being sensitive of time. Um, I look forward to working with the youth and, and anyone else who wants to have a conversation about how do we resolve the challenges of today. And they're systemic, uh, they're, not, they're not individually based. Um, and while we and Yellow Springs may, may feel like we're in a bubble, um, we're not. We're not in a bubble. We are um, in a tough jurisdiction um, and there are systemic things that we can't see and that we also have to work to undo. Uh, so I welcome the opportunity to work with you. Uh, I look forward with Mary Ann. She, I know she's working on setting up the circle. And I look forward to having a frank, open conversation. And I hope that we can all listen to each other and get uh, to where we need to be to build the beloved community. Thank you. Thanks, Josue. Um, so I want to reiterate, um, you know, Naya, I think you really, you know, identified that, like, you know, sort of challenge between de-escalation and making sure that we make it clear to people what our village values are and what we don't tolerate. So um, I want to emphasize that we will be uh, providing not only a public statement about, you know, how we thought about that particular interaction, but how we're going to move forward on these things. Um, and so, uh, so thanks for pointing that out. Um, we get it. And council, we've all listened to those recordings. We understand the nuances and you know some of the, the things that we can do better with. And, and we wanna talk to everybody about how we can do better in those interactions. Um, so with that, I wanna bring this conversation down to um, what some folks talked about. You declared racism as a public health crisis. What are you doing? And I wanna emphasize that while a lot has been done, and unfortunately at our last council meeting, um, we were focused on uh, the mass situation and didn't get to get to this particular point, but we did have a convening that many of you know about, um, about you know, with uh, justice system advisory, uh, sort of, I guess, pre-group 
to help us think about what we need to do moving forward. And I've started as I've listened to think about like, what are some things we can take immediate action on? And what are some things that we need to, I guess, take back to for more discussion? And um, part of the goal of this discussion is to get um, go ahead from council to move forward with some things. So based on what I've heard from the meeting we had a couple weeks ago from council, on my column of um, things that I think we can move forward now, which we've talked about. And some of these are small, but they can, um, they can be done quickly, and I think they can have an impact. Um, we've talked about decriminalizing uh, the possession of marijuana. Uh, it, it's one of those things that, um, you know, obviously tends to target uh, folks that, uh, you know, that, that we don't want to be targeted. And we've talked about this for a while. I think this is something that our village solicitor can um, move forward with and bring something to council at the next meeting. Um, Lisa Krieger pointed out, and we've talked about this at our meeting, about um, stopping the um, pulling people over for busted taillights and that sort of thing. Um, again, I think that's something we can take immediate action on and that our vill village solicitor can come back with advice about. Um, a third thing I have is um, exploring changing uniforms um, and uh, allowing our officers to uh, have uniforms that actually could facilitate them uh, circulating downtown easier when it's really hot and um, not looking so militaristic. I feel like this is a action that we can also pursue in the short term. The other two things that we have are the review board, which I know Lisa Krieger and Mary Ann McQueen have pushed for, forward or pushed for, and um, they've been talking to uh, mediation about, and then formalizing the justice system advisory board. So those are the five things in my, I think, Today, if council has the will to move forward with these, then we can get these in process and um, have something that we can take action on at our meeting on August 17th. Um, I have a couple things in the uh, category of going back to the advisory board. One is uh, evaluations of our uh, police team. I think there's some great work that can be done in that regard to um, make sure that the behavior that we want to see is actually happening in terms of the guidelines for village policing. Um, the proposal of de-arming our uh, police team, I think that's something that should be explored further and would also, we would need the input of um, our police chief and our mayor and other folks that are involved. And then um, the third thing I have is how can we look at um, uh, more focus on social services um, in terms of how we allocate our police department budget? So I'm not sure I've captured everything, but um, I guess I'd like to get an idea from council if there's uh, the will to move forward with some of these activities so we do start seeing some action around these, uh, around these activities. So, uh, so I don't know, uh, council members, if you have any comments. Um, yes, Brian, I um, have had lots of questions or comments that I've been accumulating, but uh, I think they've been addressed in one way or another. But certainly I will uh, just say to your latest question and concern that yes, I'm 100% uh, in favor of us moving forward with those things. Um, I don't know, I think it, if, if, it would, if it would end up being a budgetary wash with the uh, changes in equipment and uniforms. Uh, you know, we do get comments about the police budget, but we're talking about adding something to it, but I don't know if that's something we can uh, balance out from a budget perspective. But in short, I um, would strongly be in favor of moving forward. And I just wanna uh, commend all the uh, folks who've spoken previously on their issues and concerns. All right, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Lisa Krieger. Um, I have produced something in writing and also have commented 
and have been very active in a couple of projects already. So I think you all know I'm I'm with you and and with you. All right, cool. Marianne McQueen. I'm good. Okay. Lauren Carillis. Thank you. Um Everybody's comments are so important and I appreciate them all very much. Um, yes, Brian, the list you gave, should we should move forward. I'd also like to add to that list something that the Justice System Task Force that worked for two years uh, brought forward. And that was a recommendation that we um, have the village solicitor also work in mayor's court and with the police and I presented a proposal for adding that to the contract, and, and I think Brianna is open to that. One thing that the solicitor can do is training, and I also would like to ask that she develop, and it could be a half hour to an hour Zoom training that officers could watch at their um, when they have time, because it's obviously hard for her to reach all the officers on all the shifts but it's about the importance of the First Amendment rights of demonstrators. And the ACLU has done some important training on this. I attended one myself online, and I think it's very important for officers to understand that uh, people, they call it the First Amendment for a reason. It's so important for people to be able to express their concerns, their grievances to government and what needs to change. And um, I'm also very much in favor of us continuing. We have to pay for overtime, we pay for overtime. I view it as a, an important government function. It's as important as if, say, we have a water line break. Suddenly we gotta spend, you know, even tens, tens of thousands of dollars to support that government function. This is a government function to support the First, Man First Amendment rights of people. So I say, you know, we need to do what we need to do to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And, you know, and I would say to that last point, um, you know, I think that the, the village team is pretty clear that village council wants to support uh, in whatever way we can the protests and the marches and keeping people safe. Um, so thank you for adding um, the village solicitor. I think that goes under the, we can explore what that looks like immediately. And the other thing I did wanna mention is, um, uh, others have mentioned this, but I remember at Angela Allen in particular at our meeting talking about um, reinvigorating our community conversations so that uh, there's better understanding uh, between other par all parties involved. Um, and so I wanna add that to the list. So um, we will be uh, committing to a monthly meeting for the Justice System Advisory Board, and we will have that um, date and time out this week. Um, and I guess the other thing I can promise is that when we come back on August 17th, um, by working with our village solicitor, Brianne, and the village team, we will have some, uh, some things that we can actually take action on at our next meeting, and we will continue the conversation. So uh, please keep in contact with us. Uh, I appreciate everyone that was on the call to talk about this. I'm sorry that we didn't get to it at our last council meeting, but by no means does that mean that we are shirking on our duty to prioritize this. So thanks everyone, and uh, we do need to move on to our next topic. Um, and that next topic is uh, talking about uh, finances. Host way. All right, thank you, Brian. I would like to call your attention to the July financials. Um, there's several sheets on a statement of cash revenue and expenses. There's a revenue report that um, highlights or in detail uh, demonstrates the expenses that we've had year to date. Uh, according to expense categories. There's also a bank report, shows our, our cash position on all of our bank accounts. And there's a council commission budget uh, report to see what we spent in our council budgets and what is available. And also a council summary report, which I will speak for, uh, on for sake of time, I will focus primarily on this one. Yeah, because it requires your uh, approval. So at, at the conclusion of my report, I would like the council to vote on accepting the second quarter report uh, 
June 21. So here to date, we have received seven million eight hundred and seven dollars. Sorry, seven million eight hundred and seven thousand seven hundred and nine dollars and sixty two cents. And today we spent seven million seven hundred and forty six thousand nine hundred and fifteen dollars and ninety three cents. Our total cash position uh, for revenue from revenue and expenses. Hey, Josue, I'm sorry to bust in, but um, we're having trouble hearing you. Um, and uh, maybe Sean's coming for a solution, but you've been kind of garbled. Okay. okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll speak Actually, closer it, to the mic. Is this it sounds good. It sounds good now. Okay, all right. Um, I'll recap on the financials through second quarter of 2020. So to date, we received $7,807,789.62. And year to date, we spent seven million seven hundred and forty six thousand nine hundred and fifteen dollars and ninety three cents. Um, our our cash uh, our statement of cash from revenue expenses um, for uh, to date is ending balance of six million seventy two thousand eight hundred and ten dollars and sixty six cents. Any questions on this uh, summary statement? All right. Anything else, Josue? Josue. Josue, you're muted. Am I muted? My oh snap. You're back. back. Okay, my speaker's not working. The audio thing. It just okay, am I on now? Yes. Sorry, well, uh, sorry about that. Um, I hope you were able to hear all the summary uh, report. I also want to point out that our utility roundup program is strong. Um, to date, we received uh, three thousand two hundred ninety-five dollars and eighty-one cent, and we've continued to provide assistance to on, on the utility roundup. And to date, we've uh, provided two thousand eight hundred and twenty-four dollars and fifty-one cent. Um, just in the last two months under the COVID-19 pandemic for the month of May, we provided $715 in assistance and for the month of June, $575.89. We have a very healthy balance in our utility roundup program of $8,311.43, which we anticipate using very soon as we uh, have started to put individuals on payment plans um, those, these are individuals that have fallen behind due to the COVID pandemic, and uh, everyone would have been issued a letter. And want you to know that we want to work with everyone, and we want to do all that is possible to help uh, everyone get through this. And part of that is uh, making these resources available and putting in place payment plans for um, for those that can. So, Brian, with that, I would like um, uh, approval on the. Through June 2020. All right, for the quarterly financials, uh, I'll make yeah. that motion. Second. Okay, and Judy, if you want to call the roll. Yes, Curlis. <coughs> yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Housh. Yes. Thank you. Okay, All right. thanks, Oswai. Yes, one more thing, Brian. Yeah. I, I want to provide a brief update on where we are in projections on the financial impact related to COVID-19. The projection that we put in place in April and May is still holding, so um, we do not need to make any additional budget adjustments. As you saw from our from our, our supplemental report, um, and it, separate from those changes, we do not need to make any changes to revenue and expenses. So we are are still holding. If anything changes, I'll report back to council and we'll make the necessary budget ad adjustments. And Josue, have we heard about FEMA um, funds yet? 
So we um, the we have challenges in terms of how we how we request supplemental. So we submitted our law enforcement uh, grant proposal because that is 100% covered. FEMA only covers 70% of the eligible expenses. So over a month ago, we're going on two months um, of having submitted the law enforcement grant to cover all the COVID-19 related expenses. Um, and we wanted to try that route first because if we get 100% there, we know that there are things that we can go after FEMA um, for, or we can pursue FEMA to cover. And that would... Um, so we're, 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 we've checked, reached out to the law enforcement, the Department of Justice on those grant dollars. Uh, they still haven't made a decision or application, but I understand that it's in its final executive review. Uh, we're also preparing our FEMA package uh, to send that paperwork off. We have a timing issue. We can't double dip on the resources. So um, we can't get reimbursed from multiple locations for the same expense. So. Timing was important, so we've got that law enforcement grant in, and we're getting our packet ready for FEMA. So if that doesn't come through, it's going right off to FEMA, and we should have a faster response um, from FEMA uh, regarding that. Uh. Now, we also have the CARES Act money, which is 130000 and you heard us speak about that earlier. And so all of the expenses that we've had today related to the emergency response for the pandemic would be covered under the CARES Act. Now, we're trying to get all the free money that we can, so we want to exhaust the law enforcement grant and the FEMA grant before we tap into our CARES Act money. Um, those expenses will be covered under CARES Act, but if we can get money elsewhere, we're going to go get it. We're going to go get it. Um, and as you see, our team uh, has been very good at uh, applying for these opportunities, and we got that $1.6 million. And so we're, we're, we're uh, pursuing those opportunities. Did I cover your question, Brian? Yeah, thanks for that, Josue. And I think, you know, that you also reminded me that, you know, the more that we can get uh, reimbursed from, you know, the police funds or FEMA, the more of the CARES Act money we can put out into the community. So, yeah, I think that's really important. And, and not just put out in the community, but also make those investments that are going to have a multiplier effect for us uh, in the community, building resiliency and, and doing a, uh, be in a better position. Uh, just, this, uh, just this week, we were able to get an additional Wi-Fi signal for the train station, and that's not a permanent fix to, to all of our challenges, um, but it certainly is another access point that we have in our community for our residents, for school children that need internet access uh, and don't have it. But um, in broadband, we want to make um, greater investments that will build resiliency in our community, and it's going to make our community much more competitive. And competitive, I've talked about the labor markets. We have a lot of folks in our community that depend on the internet to, to be able to work. And we have service providers that just uh, are not giving us quality service. And so we're thinking about how do we, uh, what kind of investments we can make to better position Yellowstone. All right, thanks, Josue. Uh, appreciate that update. And uh, I think we're now ready to move into new business. And um, so I think uh, we've got Laura's letter to Governor DeWine that's up first. Um, you know, I just want to mention, you know, we've already said that it's an amazing letter. Laura, thank you so much for putting it together. Oh, I personally uh, think your idea of, um, you know, putting it out there for comment to, um, you know, any of the, the folks that might, you know, be interested would be good. Um, can I just mention three thoughts that I had real quick? Um, one is, I'm not sure if the Amy Acton reference in the first paragraph is a plus or not uh, with Governor DeWine. I, I just don't know what the fallout was there. Um, I know it's a random plus after high school and um, and then I thought we should add scenario-based training to our list of the innovative training that's out there. Um, but anyway, those were just things I noticed. Laura, I don't know if you want to say anything else about the letter, but I certainly support it. Yeah, I guess I feel a sense. I I I actually forgotten because it was a couple of weeks ago, but I did have did circulate it to some of the um, key people on the 
Greene County Committee for Compassionate Justice and uh, people did get a look at it and I've made some changes. So, and it is a draft and thank you for your comments, Brian, but I think there's a bit of urgency to get it to the governor to support the governor in moving in some of these positive directions. And it, um, so I would be, uh, and I would like to make a motion that with those uh, changes to improve the draft that council send the letter from council just to get it in going in a timely manner. Yep, and I second that. Second. All right, Lisa seconded. Um, uh, Judy, let's do a quick roll call on that. Sure, Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Curlis. Yes. McQueen. McQueen. Housh. Yes. And yes. Um, and I like Laura's idea. I think this is the kind of letter that I like everybody to sign and we can use electronic signatures if necessary um, so we can facilitate that. But uh, the other recommendation I had, Laura, was that I think we should send this to um, legislative leadership. So, um, you know, the, uh, the leaders in both the House and the Senate, because uh, I think ultimately they have a role in this too. Yeah, and some of the suggestions came from like the um, Legislative Black Caucus and the um, some of the other leaders. So yes, we definitely should. Cool. Okay, um, next up, let's go ahead and slot in the uh, wayfinding signage project here. And um, let's see, well, since we've got Karen on, do we have Karen on still? Yes. Okay, Karen, I see you. Yes, sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, why don't you give us the high points on this? Well, I don't want I know it, the meeting's going late, so I don't want to take a lot of time. Um, it's a pretty detailed proposal. Um, but it's just something that the idea of wayfinding and people being able to find their way through town and us giving people an intentional pathway. Um, and I think it's really... Um, interesting i mean it, it's pretty critical right now with the COVID situation because um, instead of people wandering around aimlessly and you know perhaps parking in the neighborhoods if there's better signage um, downtown and and better ways for people to be able to find their way through town they will be much more intentional and purposeful about how they're traveling um, so that's that's one thing that i think is a great community benefit, but um, I'm the director of the Chamber of Commerce, so my responsibility is to support our businesses, and that's what this is really about, is a way to, um, to show our businesses, to, to give the businesses a tool that they haven't had. You know, the Chamber does a, a great visitor's guide. We, we distribute a lot of them, and they actually, it actually is a great map but it's a small map. And so I think what this would do would be expand that map um, for one piece, which is the directory, um, which would be this up close um, kind of personal where, where people, when they're at the train station, um, I showed one at Mills Park Hotel, you know, they really could go in a number of places, perhaps at King's Yard. Um, people could be able to stand there and see where all of the businesses are, where the destinations like Glen Helen are, uh, uh, Yellow Springs Brewery, those types of destinations. So um, we really think um, that at this point that, that the businesses are desperate in need of some sort of, of help. Um, there's been some great work done by the Community Foundation and also by the Development Corporation to infuse funds into, um, into specific businesses um, through grants, through loans, and through the Uplift program. But what's exciting about this is that it will actually impact every business, every nonprofit who does events, who does, who has gallery openings, who um, might have a theater show or something. So this is, this is a really, just a really important tool um, that will um, better allow visitors and 
even people, especially newcomers to town, to be able to find out where they're uh, where they want to go and how to get around to visit our businesses. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, and I really love the Google Maps dimension of this work too. You know, to think about like that, you know, app piece. Um, which ties in so nicely with, you know, the downtown Wi-Fi that we're working on. Um, yeah, I, I can just reiterate what Karen said that, I mean, being downtown for three weekends now, it's clear to me that our downtown businesses want this and find it valuable. I like what Karen's emphasized about how it also like helps address the Yellow Springs experience during the COVID crisis, um, but I think it has implications beyond, especially with some of the like things we're doing with the trail um, to support active transportation. Um, so ultimately, uh, I saw in the proposal the ask uh, is eleven thousand, and I see that other organizations are contributing as well. Um, we know that we have CARES Act dollars that we potentially like to um, put out there to support businesses. But I also want to mention that we have, um, we still have funds in our commissions uh, account, uh, quite a bit actually, because we haven't spent much this year. And we have um, funds left in our economic development fund. So I guess I'm less concerned about where the funds come from right now, but I see the urgency and that this project is going to move forward next month. So I certainly support it. Um, I don't know how other council members feel. Brian, um, yes. I, I support it and I would be willing to vote on uh, agreeing to support it with $11,000. Um, I think it would really help in terms of just, well, basically everything Karen said, so I don't need to repeat what she said, but I did have an experience this past week of being on a bike trip, biking at the edge or sort of through some small towns, and it was like, well, gee, we'd like to stop and get an ice cream cone or something. Could not find anything at all, and it was very uh, frustrating, and it really diminished the impact of the bike trip, so it made me when I heard about this, it made me realize how nice this would be. And really, then I think people will be like, anyway, I, I won't go on. I support it, and I would vote in favor of uh, providing $11,000 from whatever fund it would be. I would, right. uh, I would echo uh, Marianne's comments. I would uh, support it. Uh, I would vote for it as well. And I'm awfully concerned about her getting her ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Laura? I make a motion that we fund the wayfinding signage. Can, can we, I, I would really, I, because there was a comment made that there was a lot of money in board and commission funds, and I know a lot of that has been pulled out uh, and pulled way, way back on, uh, given the current economic situation. I, I might think you'd want to get a word from Colleen or Josue as to whether that's $11,000 as a commitment <clears throat> can make. Well, well, I mean, the re report in our packet says we have 28000 and that we've spent 1000 something. Um, but honestly, I hope this can come from CARES dollars. But anyway, you know, it, yeah, if there's something we're missing, that can certainly be corrected. I mean, I'm, I'm just voicing a concern. Josue, if there's not a concern, go go on. I, uh, Judy, Judy I, I do appreciate you raising the concern. As it is right now, all the COVID care money expenses, we spread it all over the all over the, the budget. We took it from where we had funds available because we didn't have a dedicated COVID-19 uh, COVID response budget. So we just took it where we had we had uh, unspent funds, so I would I would appreciate um, the flexibility to look at our budget and see where we get it uh, out before a decision is made. Or if a decision is made, then I have the flexibility of the allocation is made that there may be expenses. Uh, I would have to take it from wherever I can. Yeah, I mean I think it's got to be the latter. Um, given the, you know, the timeline for this project. Um, but that's why I mentioned that I think we've got at least three funds that are relevant that have money in them. Um, okay, so we've got a motion. Did we get a second? 
I'll second it. Okay, uh, Judy, if you want to call the roll. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Curlis. Yes. Housh. Yes. Thank you. All right, thanks for bringing that forward. Um, Thank you all. All right. Uh, Okay, next on the agenda is um, the proposal for Short Street. Um, Lisa, what are you, what are you thinking about? So I, that? I can be, I can be really, really brief on this and, and give an update. So, um, you know, I apologize that I muddied the intention to rename Short Street with a second idea, which neither of which were discussed at the last council meeting but still managed to um, cause a lot of public discourse, which isn't a bad thing. Um, but I wanna tell you really what is at the heart of the motivation for this renaming of Short Street. Um, I know that there are some community members who, you know, are fine with, you know, yeah, it's a short street. That's a fine name for that street. Why change? So why change is because there's a, tremendous rich history of African Americans in Yellow Springs. And I want to elevate this encyclopedia and the information that's in it. I want to partner with the 365 group to do that. And as many of you know, there's the Wheeling Gaunt statue at one that's going to be at one end of town and it has a QR scan code. And then in addition, the senior center who will get an agenda uh, planning come be coming to us soon when they're ready is another bronze um, installation of the Reverend Wesley Matthews who founded the senior center and was an AME pastor. And there also is going to be a scan code there. And then by putting at that street, another um, public art, either bronze or a mural, that links to the QR codes for the encyclopedia. We are then deeply supporting these walking tour ideas that people who come to our community will be immersed and enriched by this history. So that's what's behind the my intention, right? And perhaps I didn't articulate that very well. There were several community members who I spoke with in the original idea. I spoke with the businesses adjacent to that street. So I know that other business owners took great exception to the idea that I pulled each and every business. No, I did not, although I subsequently have spoken to many. The uh, 365 uh, leadership team recommended Freedom Way, and you can read in my um, proposal the quotes from them of why they came up with that name. Um, however, um, in recognition of the swirl around whether that should be the name or not, particularly drawn from social media, we talked about it at Art and Culture Commission. I spoke with it about it more with John Gudgel from 365, and on Thursday, we're having a meeting that's going to be attended by a, a fairly wide group of people, including business owners, um, including a representative from Antioch College, 365. Um, I have invited a couple of the youth that have been activists to talk a little bit about the name and what it means. So I guess at this point, what I would like to ask is, how does the village council feel about a street name change in support of elevating the history of African American in Yellow Springs and supporting that sort of walking tour concept? If you feel okay with that, I can continue working with that group to come up with a name that is um, maybe a consensus about what that name might be. Well, Lisa, let me first of all thank you for all the wonderful work that you do. You, uh, I, I feel that my efforts in comparison to yours are uh, almost shameful, but you do a great deal of work and I appreciate you. I want you to know that 
personally and professionally. Um, and, and I think having the 365 <clears throat> group and the other groups that you mentioned, having input fr from them uh, is very, very important. Um, I, it, it, it definitely changed my attitude, uh, my initial attitude. It did not land on me well, the initial proposal, but uh, the fact that those folks are, are speaking up and that the folks that have that historical uh, references um, and their input in, uh, being part of the decision-making process, um, I think is very important and I would uh, definitely support you continuing uh, that effort. Thank you. I support moving forward. Uh, and, and I support um, the idea of having a street, not necessarily short street, but that that's okay, uh, recognize some aspect of black history in Yellow Springs. Um, I say not necessarily that street because a lot of the black businesses were on Dayton Street, for example. Um, and, and I also, I'm okay with that name. Uh, I think thinking about different names and just having it out in the public a while so that people know this conversation is going on is what I would like to see. But I definitely do support the idea of recognizing in some way by uh, renaming a street and maybe other means uh, recognizing the rich black history of Yellow Spring. And it occurred to me, Phyllis Jackson had I, I, probably one of our last matriarchs and probably one of the last black matriarchs in town just died of calling it Phyllis's way. But that that's for on down the road. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. And you know, I just want to say the reason that it was that street is having to do with kind of creating a one end of town and the other from where the Gaunt statue is going to be, and then the senior center, and you know, that was kind of where that came from. Um, Brian, do you want me to talk about the street mural? Sure, that'd be great. Okay, so I, you know, I mentioned earlier that the um, Art and Culture Commission is, is meeting again, and two things happened at once. Uh, uh, I was at a 365 meeting and understood that there was going to be a call for a street mural that said Black Lives Matter, so proactively wrote, reached out um, to Josue and um, we have a lot of, we have support from the village to, to make that um, happen um, and, and also a banner at the south, south gateway to town that will be made that say, says Black Lives Matter. So I'm also collaborating with people from 365 on that and the design of it and Art and Culture Commission around design using a local artist. So that's in early, early planning phases, but wanted to mention it. So, so I think, uh, you know, so as Lisa said, you know, the, uh, the street banner for Black Lives Matter is in process and, you know, we have a spot on the south end of town to put a banner. Um, with the uh, Black Lives Matter street mural, um, the other great thing is we have Cheryl Durgens, who's part of the Arts and Culture Commission, who has background in, um, in organizing uh, community art projects. And she has indicated her willingness to lead this project and customize it to Yellow Springs and our values. So Lisa and I wanted to check in to see if council supported um, the Black Lives Matter mural uh, initiative. And as Lisa said, we've talked to Josue about the village being able to support that. Well, well I certainly do support it. I guess I, I would wonder, are there restrictions with regard to Xenia Avenue, US 68? Or would it therefore have to be on the side street or, or, or on Dayton Street? So the two streets that have been talked about are Short Street and Quarry Street between Dayton and Xenia. Sounds good. Okay. Um, Marianne, Laura, any thoughts or concerns? Um, you know, I had assumed looking at the picture from 
uh, Cincinnati that it was on a walking street, not a car driving street. But maybe that maybe I was wrong in that regard. Um, it, it, we don't have a non-car driving street, but if we put all this energy into something that's anywhere near as beautiful as that thing in Cincinnati, it would be nice to have it, I mean, maybe on the bike path or something. I mean, so that cars aren't just driving over it because it just seems like it would ruin it. But I think it's a wonderful thing to do. Okay. Laura? Yeah, I support the um, artistic endeavors and I agree with Mary Ann. I, <clears throat> finding the right, and the commission will find the right place for it with working with the village. On the, on the, and I'll talk more about the Freedom Way idea when we get to the restructuring the work of the council. I okay. okay. Um, all right, sounds good. All right, so it sounds like we've got Will to do that and then Lisa will let the uh, commission take that over. Um, okay, Josue, I think the next item is yours, is the potential food trucks uh, on village property. Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, I've included in my, I've included a report on this. This is page, uh, it's on page 159 of the 234 page package. Um, as I previously mentioned, we have a petition from a local resident about operating a food truck on, uh, on front of the, the railroad street. This is not on the actual street itself. It's on the parking spaces that face Dayton street on railroad, uh, street parking lot. Uh, so would not be taking any parking offline. As you know, we've added over 70 spaces in the in in the downtown area in a parking quarter. So the impact on parking is 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 very small. With the value that it, it could bring to the area is significant. And so we wanted to we wanted to share this thought with council on what we were proposed to do here. Um, obviously this would have a public hearing process as it's something that needs to come, needs to go to planning commission. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm sharing the information with you so that you know what 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 the details are and um, I think it's it's appropriate use of public space. Uh, I think it it's aligned with some of our with our village values to support a vibrant, uh, culturally diverse economy, uh, and this is coming from a local resident. So it's not um, folks from the outside that are looking to set up shop here. Um, this is coming from a local resident. I think it's worth uh, listening to the opportunity. In my package, I included what what would be some of the the conditions, um, in addition to any conditions that planning commission would put in. And that would be that the food truck would operate under the requirements of mobile food vending. Um, no food trucks would be allowed to park overnight. There would be specific times, days and times for food trucks to operate at the location which will be set by planning commission. A zoning permit will be issued uh, under the approval of the conditional use. The, there will be a fee uh, to operate at the site and there will be no generators uh, allowed to be operated by the food truck. We will actually provide electricity. We have an electricity pole there and that we could uh, provide a, a electricity access. So in a nutshell, that's the, um, that's the the opportunity there's a lot more details in our in our report to council thanks so sway so i i think one of the things i want to highlight and that i appreciate is that you know Josue recognized that you know this you know, there was some sensitivity around this issue and so he wanted to gauge what council's thoughts were um knowing that this is something that will come to planning commission so, uh, you know, I think there's already been some feedback from um, some of our uh, local uh, merchants, uh, restaurant owners, but uh, maybe we can just briefly share any feedback we have with Josue and, and Planning Commission um, uh, on this topic. So, Marianne, do you want to say anything? I, I'm not clear whether only one food truck would be there and if so if it would be 
the local resident. But at, at any rate, I'm okay with it going to planning commission. Excellent question. Yes, there, there would only be one food truck allowed to operate at a time. And currently the petition that we have is from a, a local resident, a longtime resident. Uh, and there's a second uh, resident with a food truck that um, that I understand is very interested in this opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. Kevin, were you going to say something? Yeah. Well, yeah. So it gets it just got muddy <laughs> when Josue mentioned the the second truck. I guess in terms of you know, are we talking just one location now, or are we, are we looking at an additional location? Is it going to be some sort of a timeshare? Um, We're just looking at one location, and that will be the only site that we will propose. So if there's there would only be one food truck at a time. And currently the realm of, of potential candidates for this are one, the, 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 the person that directly petitioned us and another resident who also has food, but they have not made a particular request. Yeah, and, and quite honestly, I, in my first reading of this, I saw the $50 fee, but I, I guess I didn't catch that we're providing electricity in lieu of generator. Um, $50 seems low a bit to me if we're providing electricity. Yeah, so we can adjust the fee. That's that's a starting point. We can we can uh, increase the fee. We did a pre preliminary assessment of what its common use of a of 110 volt um, usage, and think that the fee the fee will, will cover um, the use. But you know, I, I that. That's my limited understanding of how electrons move through the wires. Johnny would know a lot more on what the potential usage of the, of the electricity will be. But certainly, we want to be in a. We don't want to put ourselves in a position where this is a losing proposition. Um, we we want to make sure that we cover the cost and stop. the proposal. Read that that fee could go into the economic development for us to be able to make uh, economic uh, development investments. Uh, in, downtown area, improve the parking lots. Uh, we want to create this uh, additional revenue streams for economic development activity. Understood. Thank you. Towards wayfinding, wayfinding signs and projects. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Lisa? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate this desire to, um, you know, meet this person um, on, on level funding who's petitioning, but I, I'm very curious about whether it's legal to restrict something like that to a local resident. I would want to know that from legal counsel because I know things have um, come up before where we, you know, like for housing, you you can't restrict it. Um, it just, it feels to me like opening a can of worms where then multiple other entities would then make claim to equal space or equal time. So I'm worried about that. And I, I'm also just worried about, like, is now the time? Is now the time with the season coming to the end, um, with the concerns about public gathering, is now the time um, with businesses struggling to introduce more competition to downtown? You know, maybe this is an idea that we can bring forward in the future as we have more recovery from the virus. Those are my thoughts. All right, Laura, anything else? Yes, I'm, <clears throat> I, I think it is a can of worms. There are a lot of questions that are raised by uh, our policy on renting public property for private enterprise endeavors. Um, I certainly am not interested in bringing any more competition into town uh, for our vendors. And I, I don't think we could restrict this to vend to local residents. Um, I'm just not interested in doing this at this time. And also I'll comment it on it later in the meeting. Thank you. And let me just add, Brian, I also yeah. am concerned about the competition for local uh, restaurant owners and in full disclosure, uh, you know, I've heard some comments from some very close friends uh, regarding this. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, when Jose, Josue brought this to me, um, you know, I, I raised many of the things that, 
you know, council members have raised and, and we've also heard from, you know, some limited feedback from uh, citizens um, that there are concerns, you know, around the brick and mortars and, and that competition and everything. So, um, you know, I think ultimately this kind of, this was the goal of this conversation is to raise these issues and, um, and let planning commission know that that there are some concerns. Uh, the local piece is, is certainly resonates, but you know, how do we control that and, and, and what does that look like? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it seems complicated, but um, I, I guess that's something that if it is evaluated, we'll get more feedback on. Um, so Josue, did you need any more from us on this or? So I appreciate all, the, all your thoughts and concerns. We would work through them. I'm not afraid of complicated. Uh, we'll 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 look more into it, and again, planning commission will vet all of it. I I don't think we're authorizing to go to planning commission. No, you're not authorized. There is no action to authorize here. How does it go to planning commission if if we're not interested? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one, but uh, my office can bring it to planning commission. You can just put things on planning commission agenda. We can we can request a conditional use of our public space. But I don't know. I make a motion that we do not do that. Uh, is there a second? Second. Um, okay. Uh, any further discussion before we vote? All right, Judy, let's call the roll. Perlis. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. McQueen? No. no. Thank you. Um, who am I missing here? Krieger. Yes. Tausch. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, all right. So next up, uh, we've got the, um, board and commission restructuring reports. Um, and I understand that there are some different thoughts on this. Uh, I think the goal is to get a brief update on uh, opportunities and concerns. And uh, I'm not sure that we're gonna be voting on anything um, tonight. So, and, and yes. It's 10 o'clock. Right. So we've been going for three hours. So before we get into it, could, we, could you elaborate more upon what you're anticipating for this topic and how much time we have need for other topics? Uh, yeah, so I would say that, um, you know, we're going to limit this discussion to 10 minutes. I know Patty Bates has been waiting patiently. She has maybe some comments, um, and I want Laura to be able to share. But the intent really is to kind of highlight what are the opportunities, potential concerns, and then we can look at this further in the future. Um, for the manager's report, uh, I would suggest it's on a question basis. So Josue did an excellent job with his report this time. Uh, I mean, you always do Josue, but I really liked how you boiled it down this time. And then future agenda items uh, should be quick. So, um, so Laura, do you want to start us off on this one? Yeah. And I just want to point out uh, for the agenda for the future, Brian, you know, this item got put down at the l last part of this list behind the wildlife habitat renaming. You know, there are things that, that came later than this thing. So yeah. I, I just want to point that out. Yep. So tonight is actually a really good example of why I think, and I made this proposal back in January at our retreat that we consider doing what many, many other councils do and is quite common, and that is we organize our work around um, committees that are usually correspond with departments. 
like the uh, streets department or a general fund public works committee that you know council's main responsibility is for three things legislation policy and the purse strings handling the money in terms of allocating it and counts a lot of governments the council organizes its work around these committees um, and so if we had a general fund public works committee it would be the first place where new items come to be hashed out before they come to the floor of council one reason we have four hour meetings is we don't have committees in my view because some things could be hashed out and never brought forward because it didn't really pass muster or there were a lot of problems at the committee level, like a policy on, on renting public property for private enterprise. It may never have come to the floor of council if it had gone to a committee first. Or the, um, the Freedom Way has merit, certainly, but there are a lot of questions about rename, you know, whether we should and what name. And there's a lot of stuff that needs to be hashed out, as Lisa point. And Lisa actually created her own ad hoc committee to deal with that. And I and these things really need to have a home, a council committee for each of these things. So I have submitted a a uh, report that our, we had a working group and I thank everybody who participated, Patty Bates, Postway Salmeron, Lisa Krieger, myself, Judy Kintner. We've worked long and hard on this proposal and there was an agreement on everything, but I simply at this point want to ask people to, it's been in the packet for a couple of weeks now. So please read it and review it. And we, and, um, and, Council has naturally kind of started moving this direction. It did create a finance committee, for example. By the way, the finance committee is often one of the most important and powerful committees on council because of the purse string power. So you do have a finance committee, although right now they sort of are limited to working with the treasurer on the investments. But that's where budget, all those budget considerations, and that's gonna be very important this year with our, we think, um, financial distress. We don't know yet, I, and I don't mean to I say that uh, it's possible, let's just say that with the COVID situation. So um, some of the, and that doesn't mean commissions go away. Some of them have because of, you know, uh, the one, for example, um, economic sustainability, its functions largely got moved to the Yellow Springs Development Corporation. And that almost functions like a committee, but it's a nonprofit with special statutory powers. So um, some of the commissions would remain because we don't have a department that corresponds to that, like our commission, for example. But I'm, so the proposal's there and I'd like everybody to read it and provide some helpful responses. You can email me uh, or Judy Kentner and we can share it all with council. And I'd like to put this, um, I'll talk to you, Brian, about further discussion on, a, I've even thought just putting it off till the next council retreat, because honestly, we have so many things we need to deal with with COVID and other um, things that are of much higher importance at the moment. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and thanks, Laura. I want to say, uh, you know, I appreciate, because, um, you know, I think part of why I wanted to make sure we at least had this on the agenda was to see some of the ideas. And I agree with you. A lot of those things we're already looking at. So, um, so I appreciate that. Um, so I want to give uh, Patty Bates a chance to, uh, uh, comments and uh thanks patty for hanging in there so it must feel like uh nostalgic or something huh right um yeah it's uh it's like a year ago gosh um thank you brian for um giving me an opportunity to speak a little bit um and um i i think that laura's proposal has a certain merit um i think things like the finance committee um, and certain other committees that it would work exceptionally well for. Sorry, I can't get my picture to come up for some reason. It's not uh, not showing on you. But um, I think there, I, 
personally, I had two reservations about it. Um, one was a reservation specifically about um, the um, Public Works Committee. Um, we, when, the, when we talked about Public Works, um, Josue very astutely divided it into enterprise funds versus um, versus um, uh, non-enterprise entities such as streets, the Bryan Center, and other facilities, those kind of things. And while there seems to be a good reasoning for bringing the enterprise funds into the committee fold, um, I felt very strongly that Josue and any other village manager needed to have a lot of flexibility in the the other general fund portions of public works. Um, there, there's a lot that goes on there day to day, and he really needs to have that flexibility. The other part that I felt very strongly about is that normally in the committee structure that Laura has proposed, um, there aren't necessarily citizen members, and if there are citizen members, they don't get to vote. Um, and quite frankly, I think number one, if somebody's going to put their time in, um, they should have the right to vote. And number two, this is Yellow Springs, and I have a really difficult time believing that the citizens are going to be comfortable with a full committee uh, of just council with you know citizen input. Yes, they could attend the meetings because they would be public meetings. But if they're going to be asked to provide their expertise, I feel strongly that they um, that they should be able to also vote on this as as a representation of the community. So that that was my personal take on things, um, and I did write a document for the packet. So I'll just if you have any other questions for about what I wrote, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Patty. Appreciate that. And yeah, thanks for submitting that document too. Um, Lisa, Josue, Judy, do you want to add any quick comments before we wrap this yeah. up? Yeah, I, I also submitted a document to the um, packet and, I, and my greatest concern, and I didn't realize this until quite far along in our convening that uh, converting from commission to committee negated the voting powers of participating sworn community members. And in fact, um, on these areas where we didn't agree, we had a four I, one nay. And if instead everybody had an equal vote, we would be coming to you with a proposal that we were willing to go forward with. But in fact, by having it be this way, the perspectives of Patty and Josue and Judy were all negated. These are clearly people who have a lot of um, uh, knowledge. And I, I disagree that it should just be the two council people who should have the only say. Related to that, I have a concern about workload for council because this structure would require us to always both be in attendance. So the way it is now, for example, um, I'm primary for art and culture. I'm gonna be out next month, Brian will cover. But if we went forward with this model, we would both have to be there because we would be the only two people who have the say. So I, I think that it doesn't really save time and would argue that instead, the reason that we have these long meetings is because we have this rich, wonderful citizen comment. That's what caused us to run long today, and I'm always willing to do that. And I also agree with uh, Patty that um, the Public Works Committee can be an ad hoc design, but I don't support the creation of it as a standing meeting. And otherwise, I agree with everything. And so we made a lot of progress, but we did hit some pretty significant sticking points and Curlis was unwilling to go with a majority rule vote. Thank you. Can I respond please? Yes. I, <laughs> this is a report, there's a minority view and a majority view presented in the report. I also am very sad that um, 
Patty and Lisa are characterizing this as um, preventing public input. This is a uh, first level review of ideas that, that people want to come to the floor of council where obviously the same kind of public comment gets to happen, but, and, and Lisa herself just created a committee about this Freedom Way, which is a public street. And we don't know who has voting power. We don't know how, who's gonna push what to the floor of council. This way, you know the elected representatives, the two council people who the voters voted for are moving something to the agenda. It's not that other people's input at that committee level is unimportant, it certainly is. But if it can't get two committee votes to move it to, just to move it to the agenda, then, then maybe it shouldn't be on the agenda. Now, that doesn't mean that three other members of council couldn't say, well, we, we like it anyway, you know, so we're gonna put it. I'll take Betty Hughes Park, for example. That, to me, that should never have come to the floor of council. But it never went to a committee first to work out some of the questions, lots of questions people have. So it's a sounding board. Uh, again, <laughs> probably almost every single council in every community in Ohio has council committees. It's like, it's not uncommon. And the elected representatives are the ones who move it forward. That It's about moving an idea forward in a more formed su uh, substance. And general and the general fund, if, if council has any power at all over the purse strings, it's certainly over general fund money, which is tax money. So that's a very important committee uh, to have is a general fund public works committee, water, sewer, streets, the things that we um, have to go to the taxpayers for levy money for. So in any event, it's out, that's the proposal is that we um, consider restructuring how we do work. And uh, obviously I think maybe uh, I'm the only one who thinks this is a great idea, but uh, we have developed it very well. I think we did great work. And um, Brian, I, I'll talk to you about maybe when, when, when it can come to the agenda. Cause right now just one, whoever has an idea just comes to Brian and it gets on the agenda. It doesn't even have a development process. Right. And that's what concerns me. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to- Brian, I would... Okay, real quick, yeah. Brian, I would like to weigh in since a lot of it has to do with how my administration uh, manages its work and does its work. Okay. I am in agreement with all that Patty has said and Lisa has said, so I won't uh, repeat that. In reading the comment, there's something that Kate Hamilton uh, posted right here in the chat box that says, we need to trust the citizens who serve. And there's a similar sentiment. I share that sentiment with her. Uh, there's a similar sentiment about the professionals uh, that do the work day to day. And we need to trust the, the team here to do the work. I think some of the the what I've read from what I've read from the proposal and what I've gathered from our various meetings, it, in many ways, would invalidate the professionalism and the opinion of the people that serve every day to get the work done, to get the day to day done. So there's a lot of talent in in the administration. Um, there's an art to the craft, as there is a science, and I think that uh, there's a risk of questioning all the administration does to make sure that we run an efficient government. Um, so those are my sense. I personally would like um, a vote or understand the direction of council on this because it weighs on me and it weighs on the team, the wonderful team and uh, committed team that works for the village and that works for its residents to know which direction uh, council wants to go on this. Um, do we trust the the team here and the professionalism and commitment they bring to the table, or do we want to have this commission structure to guide all of the work? Brian, I'd just like to say quickly that I agree with everything Josue just said, especially about the team and the talent that the village has on the team. Uh, thanks, Patty. Thanks, Josue. 
Um, so, so, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Because that idea it relates to that public works committee. There is a lot of really good stuff in this proposal. There are those points of of disagreement where we had, as as Laura said, the report accurately reports who voted aye, nay, and how that. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater there. Yeah, I would say what I'm gathering is um, I don't I don't see how we can really take a vote at this point because I don't really I mean I, I've read the report I've heard lots of feedback but I mean ultimately I think there's a lot of great ideas and I think there are some pieces that um, I don't know my sense is that maybe part of it is just uh, our communication styles and, um, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I wasn't at those committee meetings, but what I would say is um, I'm really happy with the work. Um, I agree with everything I've heard in terms of like the feedback and the, the things that we need to question. Um, but I guess I'm also, I, I don't think I'm hearing Laura say that we don't value citizen feedback and I understand, um, you know, a focus on like developing ideas and efficiency. I recognize the sensitivity, you know, from our village team, um, but I don't think that's what this is about. Um, and so I guess uh, I like Laura's idea that in a setting where we can actually like all hear directly what everyone's thinking would give us an opportunity to process better. But in the short term, I do think we are borrowing, we're, we are looking at these ideas um, and like sort of figuring out where they make sense. Um, and, and so I, I see some kind of continual improvement and evolution around this. Um, so anyway, I've heard everything. I'm gonna also respect Mary Ann's point that we need to wrap up our meeting Thanks everyone for being willing to talk about this because I, I understand there's some thoughts about that this is kind of half-baked and, and still needs to be worked on. So thanks for bringing it forward and, and, and letting us all see this. So questions for Hostway about the manager's report. Brian, we, we have a treasurer's report. Oh yes, yeah. And so I wanted to cover that in my manager's report. Yeah. Um, Judy's on. Judy, you want to jump in or you want me to take over and then I head on to my manager's report? Um, if you want to just hit the high points, people, you've got it in writing. All right, folks. Uh, it's COVID-19. I want you to keep a uh, perspective on earnings. Um, despite the COVID-19 hitting in March, we still managed to get in some good revenue uh, for the second quarter. We made $18,950 in the in the second quarter, bringing our total investment revenue to $43,190. Uh, so not bad. Um, we hope to make, make just as much in the remaining two quarters of the year. We're hopeful, but uh, the markets don't look that great. There's a great report included in the Treasury report on economic conditions. I encourage you, if you need some light reading, there's plenty of good stuff in there. And so that covers it. Uh, any other questions for host way? Okay, then we are on to agenda planning. Um, anything we need to think about for August 17th? Yeah, um, you so mentioned will come uh, up. Yep. You want an, an ordinance decriminalizing marijuana or something to that effect, correct? Yes. And Gina, Gina Marie would be prepared to come to that meeting. Yeah, let's do that because we definitely should have a COVID response update and, um, and the Community Foundation has been at the heart of that. Um, so yeah, so let's confirm that with Gina Marie. We will make sure to keep that on the agenda. Anything else? Do, do we need the finance committee to bring a recommendation regarding the lodging tax since um, it, it may go unspent this year? We had allocated it to a project that isn't happening. Yeah, you know, that, um, 
Yeah, we don't have much about. to spend on lodging tax. That is true. Um, no. Let's let's yeah, let's definitely put a pin on that because it does relate to there's a plan to bring a recommendation for the CARES Act funds. Um, and I should highlight to folks that from the initial assessment from Colleen, if we don't get other funding, I mean, we, we have spent that plus um, already. So, I, you know, we don't have a lot of money to work with, but, you know, we do have an interest in, you know, seeing what we can do to support a variety of things. So that's, that's going to be on the agenda. Anything else? Brian, I just have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, the September meeting, just because we have a lot on our plate planning commission, we're trying to balance out the, the next couple meetings, um, is, is when I think you guys are going to be meeting. So, I mean, I'm sure planning commission would be willing to push it back, mm -hmm. but because of labor day, I think, I don't know, Judy, you want to weigh in on that? There's a, we've said that if the, if the, Planning Commission ever falls the Tuesday immediately following a council meeting. It is not held on that Tuesday. It is held the following Tuesday. We've already made that agreement. Okay, because this actually, you guys will actually be meeting on Tuesday because yeah, of- Yeah, so it'll meet the following Tuesday. Okay, yeah. so it'll be the following Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Uh, I have one more thing, Brian. Uh, yeah. We have, as you know, we have a barn in our capital, in our capital budget. Uh, to build a barn, we have quotes, uh, three quotes for, for the barn. This is just for the for the actual building itself, uh, not mm -hmm. the um, It's already approved in the budget, so we have that spending authority. Um, but that's that's a project we want to get off the ground. Okay. So, um, so are you thinking about? I mean, are you going to bring some kind of design to the meeting, or just? Well, I don't think we need to bring a design. This is very generic. Uh, it's okay. 60 by 200 feet uh, barn, pole barn for the trucks. It's It's uh, been uh, budgeted in our capital budget. Oh, yeah, I remember. Well, maybe yeah. just in your manager's report, if you mention, like, you know, remind folks of why we're doing that, which yep. is very important, which is to protect these expensive vehicles. So correct, correct. That is to extend the life of our materials, uh, our equipment, and whatnot. Yes. Okay, good. Um, all right. So, and if anything else comes up, you know, you can contact Judy. Um, everyone enjoy the next several weeks. Stay safe. And uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.